Good evening, everyone, at 6 p.m., and I declare this agenda forum open. Welcome, everybody, and Kaya Wanju Mali Budja. Hello, and welcome to Swan Country. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Wajak Noongar people. Sorry for interrupting your cancers while I'm speaking and uh, opening the meeting. Acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging as we continue to grow our communities together through reconciliation. Item two, the disclaimer. Agenda forums are specifically for agenda items which are to be considered at the next council meeting. Agenda forums are not decision-making forums. However, they provide an opportunity for councillors to be equally informed and seek additional information on matters prior to the presentation of such matters to the next ordinary meeting of council for formal consideration and decision. Please note that this meeting is being live streamed. The recording will also be archived and made available on the council website after the meeting. If you choose to participate in the meeting during public question time or deputation time, it is assumed your consent is given for the audio to be recorded and please keep your comments respectful to the council and other members of the um, community. Vigil images of the public will not be uh, captured. Moving on to item three, attendance and apologies. I have apologies from the Mayor, Councillor Bailey, Councillor McCulloch and Councillor Predovnik. All other councillors are in attendance. Um, item four, um, declarations of financial proximity and interests affecting impartiality. Mr CEO. Thank you. We have a few declarations of interest this evening. The first one is from Leon Vanderlyn, Executive Manager, and it's in relation to item 3.2, and that's the request for approval of public advertising for the Guildford Heritage Area Planning Policy. It's an impartiality interest as the Exec Manager's daughter partner is an employee of the consultancy element and they've been engaged to prepare the policy but he did not work on the project. Councillor McNamara in relation to item 13.4, the slip lane petition at the shopping centre in Kiara. It's a financial interest. The principal applicant is a customer of Councillor McNamara. <clears throat> Item 13.9, which is Councillor Zanino, the proposed winery and incidental cellar door and parking of commercial vehicle lot 53, number 37, Scrivener Road in Hearn Hill. It's a proximity interest. Also from Councillor Zanino, item 4.10, the new dun junction, desirability and capability for the city to invoke the sunset clause. That's an impartiality interest. Previous business partners um, owns land on the Crescent in Midland. Also from Councillor Zanino, item 3.1, the North Ellenbrook District Structure Plans. It's an impartiality interest as a relative owns land in the area. Also Councillor Congerton in relation to 4.1, the single house and storage shed. That's an impartiality interest as the um, driver pickup of eggs for um, the, the church in the area. Item 4.2, the same item, or another item, replacement of the poultry shed. Um, that's an impartiality interest as well, for the same reasons. Councillor Jones, item 4.1, which is the single house and storage shed, poultry farm, Cheltenham Road in Bennett Springs. It's an impartiality interest. And item 4.2, um, the replacement of the poultry shed, which is an impartiality interest, and the reason there is driver pickup. I also have one from Councillor Catalano as well in relation to item 3.3, which is the heritage assessments. It's an impartiality interest and member of the Midland Society. Are there any more councillors? Okay, a number of councillors. Councillor. Um, Kyle, if you can read it out and then pass them up to the CEO, please. Uh, I just or pass them straight Councillor up. Johnson's got it there. And Councillor Scanlon or Richardson, you have any? Thank you. If we could uh, have those read for the record, thanks, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Item 3.2. It's an impartiality interest. I live in a 1950 non-contributory house in Guildford. Um, Councillor Kiley, item 3.2, the Guildford Heritage Area and Local Planning Policy Impartiality as he lives in Guildford. 
Um, Councillor Scanlon, in relation to item 3.2, the Guildford Heritage Area Local Planning Policy. It's a financial, owns a property in the suburb of Guildford. Did you have an amendment, Councillor Scanlon? My apologies, Mr CEO. I believe that should be impartiality. Okay, thank you. I'll change that to an impartiality one then on 3.2 for Councillor Scanlon. Also, item 3.2 from Councillor Richardson, the Guildford Heritage Area Local Planning and that's a financial, that's impartiality, I'll change that. So to correct that one for the record, as a Gilderton Association member, and Gilderton. also item 4.5, which is the amend aspects of the DA 23418C, 23418B, that's a financial one as a home owner. That's all we have. Thank you. I don't think we need any more. Okay, moving on to... Uh, Item 5, uh, public question time and any questions relating to reports contained in the uh, agenda. Item 5.1, at the time of uh, the meeting being prepared, there was nil. Uh, questions without notice. Are there any members of the public who have questions without notice? Being no questions, we'll move on to item 6, reports and motions which previous, previous motions notice has been given. And 6.1, deputations. And in accordance with the procedures for public participation at agenda forums, all requests for person, personal deputation submissions and written submissions were required by 3pm yesterday, June the 1st. All written deputations received by 4pm on Tuesday the 1st were circulated with the prim preliminary agenda uh, last evening. And each deputation, uh, deputee, will be provided with a maximum of five minutes to address council with no time extensions allowed due to there being um, some 21 in-person deputations tonight. And then time permitting time for councillors to ask questions of the deputies uh, will be conducted <coughs> after that deputation. So part A, item 13.3, part demolition, alterations and additions to an existing single house in 1 Hill Street, Guildford. It's on page 15 of the agenda, councillor. Councillors, we had a written deputation from Mr Phil Griffiths. The next item is item 13.8, addition to a single house, lot um, or number 34024 Peachy Road, Jane Brook. It's on page 61 of the agenda. And Mr Rhys George uh, speaking to the item. Mr George, are you here? Uh, Miss George. Yes, sorry. It's okay. Um, when you start speaking, you'll have five minutes and I'll tell you when you have a minute to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, councillors. I'm Renee George and along with my husband, Reese, we are the owners of 324 Peachy Road. The conclusion of the May 12 meeting in regard to the proposal of our pool shed was deferred to the June meeting due to two factors. The first was for councillors to visit the site, which occurred on Friday the 21st of May, and the second was to investigate a series of claims. Upon analysis of our neighbours' claims that were made here on May 5th, we interpret many of the points raised as irrelevant to the construction of the pool house. We are deeply offended and feel that you have been misled by our neighbours and that we have been discredited. We were depicted as untrustworthy and many of what was presented by our neighbour was not relevant, was made up or embellished. We were here to discuss our pool house and instead she pointed out everything she dislikes about our property. The property my husband has worked extremely hard to build. We are deeply offended that someone has put a stain on our character and identity, as we have always complied to regulations to build a quality home. I could bring up all the compromises and favours we have done for these neighbours over the years and explain to you the contradictory comments and many deceptions that were expressed to you the last time we were here by our neighbour. But that is not the matter at hand. The matter is the dwelling that we wish to build but I am happy to discuss these further during question time, if you like. After listening to the meeting again, the only comment made by our neighbour regarding the dwelling was about the roof of the pool house and that she doesn't want to look at another roof. To this concern, we have said and stated on multiple occasions, we are happy to obstruct this view of the pool house from their property with vegetation and we are happy for these to be included on the drawings if need be. Now to the second point the series of claims that required investigating. I'm happy to answer and welcome any questions on these claims that were made on May 5th so that I can address them. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Councillor, if you have any questions. Councillor Scanlon. Thank you for coming back to okay. talk to us this evening. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, I'd just like to ask um, what was irrelevant in the deputations by your neighbours? Oh, yes. Um, so she suggested that um, we don't know if we can trust them as they haven't kept their word in the past. Um, we have done many things for them, lent them our bobcat. Um, she complained that we have a driveway at the back that my husband drives trucks up and down. My husband's not a truck driver. We have one truck. She asked us to park it in the shed, which we have done for her. Also, in one, um, uh, it wasn't a problem when she wanted to use it to crane her pool into their yard. One day, um, someone was at the back of our property, and when we went over, they had a photo of our back driveway and a signed document to say we have approved someone coming to crane a pool over into their property, which we didn't. So I don't want to bring up lots of petty okay, things, I, I, but... No, That's, I think you've thank you. Yeah, I didn't. Sorry. Okay. I, I didn't mean those things. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Because they're talking about the view, the obstruction of the view. Yep. And um, the view, they will view the rooftop. Yep. From the property. Yep. And um, how is that's relevant? Okay. To their so concerns? again, the tree that's behind it and the tree on our corner, before we even built our house, she has asked us to chop them down repeatedly and we have said no we can't and we don't want to um, so we could put trees in front of the pool house as well for her but in the end it's not really about the roof it's about the city views so it always comes down to the city views with her which she can still see um, and that's where we we planted a lemon tree a few years back as well she asked us if we could kindly move it because that's where she looked through to the city and we did that for her. Sorry. And we, did, and we did that for her. So that's the compromises we've always made. And again, with the pool house, we're lowering the height. We're changing to a skillion roof. So we're making lots of compromises. And also last time we were here, her first sentence was, when they built their house, they looked at lots of trees on our property. She loved looking um, into nature. And then um, in the same sentence, she said that, when Renee, Reese and Renee moved in, we asked them to chop down trees and they wouldn't. So she wants to live in nature, but then she doesn't want us, she wants us to chop down trees. I just find it all very contradictory all oh, the thank time. You, okay, thank, thank you, Okay, thank you. Just one quick more further okay, question. Thank you. I hope it's not on my paperwork. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask you, um, in the area that you're zoned as landscape, yep. are mm -hmm. you aware of the portion of land that you're able to build on? Sorry, what the is percentage? the percentage? It's 11% and we want it to be 122 and Thank you. in the report, it does across the road from us is sixty percent, in a different part of zoning. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on the opposite side. Yeah, Thank but again, you. we haven't finished our vegetation and our planting. We're still constructing, um, which is all approved. Um, our walls have just been recently rendered. We've got landscape designs for our vegetation that all will come. And yeah, it'll be great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Councillors, have you got any uh, questions of staff while we before we go on to the next item? No. The next item is item 13.9, proposed winery and incidental cellar door and parking of commercial vehicle, Scrivener Road, Herne Hill. It's on page 73. Councillor Zanino has declared a proximity interest and will leave the chamber. Uh, the first deputation will be either Miss Mel Jones or Mr Peter Seaton, or both of them. Uh, they'll have a five-minute maximum. If you could make your way to the podium, please. And once Councillor Zanino has left the chamber, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to me, Councillors. Um, I'm the southern neighbour to the Gregorinis. Um, we've lived in the Swan Valley since 1999. We bought our house and land on a gravel road with vineyards all around us. It was like paradise in our eyes, no neighbours, so close to Midland, um, excellent location. Uh, the Shire have, on two occasions have tried to bitumise our road. We've asked them not to so we can keep the traffic away. Um, also it is a popular area for horse riders and dog walkers. Um, then slowly block by block sold off, houses were built, the area was still a great place to live as all the new people got along with each other and we would have great um, get-togethers, bonfires each year. Um, our new neighbours bought and built quite close to us, which was a bit disheartening, um, but we had to live with it. Um, they're great people. 
when Daniel told me he wanted to build a shed, I said, great, go for it. Um, then he sent me the plans and I was taken back a little bit as a concrete tilt panel. I had a good look at his plans and then thought, well, I'll go and speak to him. So I went over to him one day, had a beer with him and asked him, Dan, is there another way we can do this? Can we flip the shed so the long side will be on the northern side? Um, the small part of the shed be on our side so we won't have such a big wall. Um, he said, yep, no worries, I'll have a look at it for you. A um, couple of days later he come back and he said, unfortunately we can't do that because we're trying to run a winery. The winery at the moment is going to face the vineyard. Um, if we flip the shed, the truck parking will be facing the vineyard. won't make sense. Um, so I said, well, fair call. Um, he said he'll have a look at it. Uh, then a couple of days later he explained why he couldn't. Um, I've called him on a couple of occasions trying to find a happy medium so everyone is happy and can get on. Uh, I spoke to him again today and I believe we've come to some sort of an agreement that gets that he can get what he wants and we feel a bit happier with what's going to happen with the structure. Uh, I believe the council will do the right thing for the Swan Valley and for our quirky little road, Councillor Congdon. Um, so with the Shire recommendations and the ideas I've spoken to Daniel about today. Um, I hope we can all live happier and stay in our little part of the valley. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions, councillors? Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Through you, I'd just like to ask you if you could tell us what those um, ideas are. Um, I spoke to Daniel today. Because he's 25 metres back from our fence line, he's got like a battered area for his landfill. Um, obviously, you can't use it for anything. You can't put roadways on it or anything like that. And I've asked him if he can plant a lot more trees rather than his 16 trees down his fence line, if he can put like a lot more screening trees there. He said, by all means, whatever you do to make that happier for you and your wife, which that was the issue with my wife because we're so close to each other, you know. Um, and he said, yep, yeah, he's happy to do that for us if it makes us happy. So, Great. which is... That's a great eyes. outcome. Thank you. Other questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley. Uh, Peter, you mentioned uh, 25 minutes, but on the plans it's saying 20. Am I incorrect? Oh, no, it could be 20. It's, yeah, I'd assume it's minimum is 20. It might be 25. Right, okay, thank be 20, you. So. And I've just got a question. Uh, thanks, Mr Seaton. Are yep. you the closest neighbour? I am. I'm the southern neighbour, yes. OK. And... Uh, it was at your, uh, I suppose, um, request that the road hasn't been upgraded to a sealed road? That's correct, yes. OK, thank you very much for your time. Any questions of staff, councillors? Councillor Henderson was first. Just thank you. you. These are for staff, so you can have a seat. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Henderson. Uh, in regard to uh, proposed road sealing, um, is that on our uh, uh, agenda to, to actually seal that road some stage and if so when? I'll have to refer to Mr Coton but twice before I believe that uh, we were going to upgrade the road with a uh, spray tarmac finish but the residents didn't want it. Councillor Kiley. Uh, just looking at the, the plans for the roadway it's a loop road around the property and it seems to uh, narrow around the sheds where it faces onto the neighbour's property. I'm wondering if that's suitable to put a car through that area. Um, because if it's not, then you wouldn't get a car around the whole loop unless you broaden the road. So to get a car past the, the truck shed, you would need to come a lot closer to the boundary. Is it, is, am I reading the plans incorrectly or not? Mr Russell or Mr Vandalin, thanks. Page 94. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I've been struggling with the double barrel hard copy agenda this time around. Mummy, I'm not the only one. Um, <clears throat> so, if I understand correctly, uh, Mr. Mayor, the question here is whether or not the, <clears throat> the loop road, the internal loop road driveway, is enough to navigate a car or a truck around. Is it, is it, am I correct in understanding the question? Well, where the uh, truck is to be housed, mm -hmm. um, 
you'll see there that's got like a pathway, a half road size around the side of it. Around yes. the side, is that supposed to be a loop road for the um, the winery traffic, or a footpath? I'm not sure how it would work because if it is to be broadened to have cars go along it, then you would be reducing the amount of um, trees or vegetation that could be put in there to um, satisfy the neighbours' screening. Through you, Mr uh, Deputy Mayor, the dimension on the, uh, the building, which will be the garage, is five metres. And whilst there isn't a dimension, uh, and then there is a dimension 20 metres uh, between the edge of the shed and the boundary. So look, if this is to scale, I would estimate you're looking at about two and a half to three metres of that grey driveway running to the side of the, uh, the shed. Now, it's certainly enough, two and a half to three metres is enough width for uh, a, a, a car one way to pass. It's certainly not going to be a driveway that will allow two vehicles to pass in that location, but it will allow a single vehicle to pass to the side of the, uh, the garage. And uh, just so I understand the movement of traffic for the future winery, it, are they intending to go around, is it a one-way uh, vehicle movement around that area? Uh, through you, Mr uh, Deputy Mayor, look, I, would, I think the intention of the loop is to split the left-hand side of the driveway, the access into the garage, and then driving straight from the crossover into the site, which gets you to the car park uh, on what would be the northern side of the uh, of the development of the winery, and to I suppose separate out the um, the the loop road might be well uh, for the purposes of um, turnaround access for vehicles around there, but I don't, I, the way it's been designed, and look, I, I can't speak to the rationale of the applicant, and the applicant's not here, but it seems to me that it's very much the intention to separate the parking of the vehicle to one side of the site, and the car park for the commercial winery <laughs> cellar doors to the other, that being the northern side. Councillor Henderson, last question, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just want to come back to my previous question. I was aware of the, um, the seal options that have been proposed. What I wanted to know was, um, is there a future plan for a, um, a complete seal or, or a full standard, if you like, seal Mr. for Cain. the road? Uh, no, it's not on our future works programs. In situations like that, the unsealed roads are monitored in relation to the cost of grading maintenance and traffic volumes and things like that, but it's not on our program at the moment. Councillor Scanlon, I'll take yours as the last question. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Mr Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, through you to um, Mr Russell, I'd just like to ask if um, we need to include in the recommendation that the, um, the fill that was placed within the pad went down for the house is to be approved as part of this recommendation. Through Mr Deputy Mayor, if it pleases the Council to be very specific in its decision, it might say, uh, it might mention that in the, uh, the, the, the application or the conditions that it includes the fill. I think what we're looking at very clearly with the additional plans provided in the agenda, which includes the current land levels, which is in front of the council, that an endorsement of this proposal will be an endorsement of the existing levels, uh, whether it's clearly stated or otherwise, but again, if it pleases the council to be specific, so there is any avo there's avoidance of any doubt on that matter, it can reference that in the approval. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll call on the next um, deputation, Ms. Mete Wendler. Thank you. Once again, you'll have five minutes, and I'll try and tell you when you've got a minute left. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and good evening. Thanks very much for having me. Um, I really appreciate that you guys deferred the decision at the last council meeting. There was absolutely a misunderstanding with regard to when we had the opportunity to speak and not. Um, interestingly, that has allowed us to understand the situation a lot better. Coming back to the point that was just made uh, with regard to the levels, uh, what has come to light, and I had a conversation with the manager for statutory planning on Monday, the, there's been a build-up of about two metres of soil uh, that was never part of the original plans that you guys looked at last time, nor the plans before that. 
So it is a significant change that this information uh, has come to light because basically you're not just looking at a six metre uh, dark grey tilt panel concrete wall that's 30 metres long. Uh, from a ground level, we're now looking at about an eight metre uh, apparent, which is a pretty significant structure. I asked the manager for statutory planning on Monday whether uh, planning approval was required for uh, infill to that extent. The answer was that that was required. That is a, apparently a planning policy requirement. Uh, I was also advised that the applicant had not sought approval to get uh, planning permission uh, for that amount of infill. So it's, it's pretty significant. It's a massive pile of dirt, basically, that's been carted in over the past year or so. It fundamentally changes the contours of the landscape for obvious reasons, uh, and it makes the wall, Great Wall of Hearn Hill, uh, much bigger. I'd also like to uh, challenge whether tilt panel concrete construction material is really what we want for the Swan Valley. So in my reading of both the previous Act and, and the future Act, uh, indicates that this is around the rural charm of the area, uh, and as you'll see, there's, there's plenty of sheds around. Everyone's had, pretty much has a shed, but they're all in line with rural character, typically the greens and the neutrals and whatever. None of it is really in dark grey tilt panel concrete. I've got no problems with the neighbour obviously having a shed. Everyone's got sheds. I've got no problem with the winery. It is a winery area. I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, my issue is with the construction materials. The significant wall that will be built that from the ground level will be about 8 metres tall, 30 metres long in dark grey concrete. I do not feel that that is in keeping with the Swan Valley um, outlook and scenery at all, and I'm struggling to understand why this would be permitted. Nowhere else in the, in the valley, uh, pretty much. I think there are two examples that they've managed to find, and that was included in, in, in their submission. Uh, one is Oak Over Winery, which is set back probably about a kilometre. It's in hundreds of acres of land. Let's be honest, that doesn't really uh, compare. It probably doesn't bother too many people either. Uh, the other concern I've got is with regard to the road, uh, and I appreciate uh, Councillor Henderson raising that point. Uh, the applicant has made a very strong demand in, in their letter in January, stating that now that they are getting to have a winery, uh, that really the council should tarmac the road. We don't want that. It's, part of, it's quite a quiet little road. Uh, and it's part of the, the, the rural character. And again, you've got people riding their horses, which is what most people do in that area, walking their dogs. It's, it's a quiet spot. Uh, for the council to have to pay for road upgrading uh, as part of your works program uh, to support someone parking their truck for drag racing purposes, I'm really struggling with that entire concept. Uh, and I really don't feel that what they're proposing is keeping with, with what you find in the Swan, with, with the Swan Valley, obviously an area that we all love uh, either living there or coming to for, for tourism purposes. Um, we've you also have one got, minute left, thank you. Th thank you. We've also got significant uh, uh, tarmacking off the property. So not only have you got a massive concrete shed, you've got a very big house, you've got a very significant turning circle for, obviously for a similar trailer truck that's give or take 30 metres long. Uh, we're fundamentally not looking at what is something in the Swan Valley. We're looking at something that you would expect to find in Kewdale or industrial areas of Malaga. Um, and I'd really like for you guys to consider that. You do have obviously the opportunity to consider it's essentially a two-for-one deal because the planning process was apparently not followed. Uh, so anyway, that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for your time. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley first. Um, Meta, I'm interested in the wildlife that's on Scrivener Road there. Can you explain a little bit about that? That's... Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so between uh, our property and Peter's property, you've, you've essentially got a, a narrow dirt road. It is a through road, uh, and you've got a road reserve, which is about, I'll give or take, 10 metres long, and it's about 200 metres long. It is a nature reserve, uh, and you've got significant amounts of bandicoots. Uh, we've got a local lady who's, who's looking after them and feeding them as part of some program that, that she's looking after. Uh, we know, I hate to say it, uh, but bandicoots is obviously becoming a bit of a, uh, an endangered species around the track because of uh, urban development. Um, and you've got a lot of, uh, yeah, just because it's, it's, it's land that's left to its own devices sort of thing as, as, a, as a road reserve. You've also got the property to the north of us, uh, which has got significant 
grasslands, I suppose you would call it. Uh, so you've got significant colonies of, of bandicoot and, and other wildlife that way around. Thank you. Councillor Scam, you saw your hand. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. I'd just like to ask you, um, with the materials for the shed, um, if it were palatable to the applicant to um, clad it in another material or use another material to build it, um, would that work and what materials? Uh, so, so my personal preference is that it would be different materials. I've had the conversation with the applicant. Uh, everything shed-wise in the Swan Valley tends to be collar bond. Uh, that's much more in keeping with, with what you would find around the traps. Typically, the collar scheme is not dark grey either. It tends to be more the neutral, like, mm -hmm. like the ochres, the beiges, the creams, uh, you know, those sorts of uh, collar scheme. That's a little bit more in keeping with the natural environment. Uh, so, so um, yeah, that, that's what I would prefer. Thank um, you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah. Uh, Ms Wendler, just a question for you. When did the uh, filling of land occur? So... This is purely by observation. Um, obviously, I haven't got their project plan, but at, from a neighbour perspective, uh, y y literally over the past year, every weekend there's been trucks coming and going uh, with this amount of dirt. Um, you can ask, well, why haven't you kind of noticed that? Uh, we have noticed the trucks coming and going, but I don't run around sort of spying into my neighbour's property to see what they do with some of the sand. Uh, what we've had from, from, from the applicant is that they set up a contract when they built the house, and then basically the trucks have just kept coming uh, because obviously they had the, the, the shed and the winery in mind, which we didn't know about. Uh, so they've done it all in one go, but without seeking the appropriate uh, permissions, if I understand the situation correctly. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Uh, any more questions for um, the deputy? No? Thank you very much for your deputation. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Um, Councillor Henderson, you've got a question for staff. Uh, thank you. Um, this is Mr Russell. Um, there's been concerns raised about um, potential spray painting activity that could occur on the site. Does Condition 1 or 4 uh, deal with precluding that, or do we need some small change? Uh, through Mr Deputy Mayor, if the question is whether Condition 1 or Condition 4 in the recommendation address the issue of spray painting, the answer is no. So, um, to expand on that, um, just to ensure that no other commercial activity other than uh, the approval for the um, existing facility, uh, would we need to... Uh, put something in to uh, deal with some other commercial activity, Mr. Russell. Uh, Sorry, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The if we're talking about conditions that govern the commercial vehicle parking, not so much that. Um, if what I understand, if I understand correctly, spray painting of vehicles occurring in the shed. Yep. Is that the question through Mr. Vehicles, yeah. Okay, Commercial, well, commercially? Well, certainly. Oh, sorry, let me rephrase that, perhaps. Condition one uh, is for uh, agricultural intensive and winery. Um, the properly, in fact, condition one is also for the parking of a commercial vehicle. And the parking of commercial vehicle provisions of our scheme have limitations with respect to the nature of the works that you can be doing on a commercial vehicle, i.e. the truck that the gentleman is hoping to park. So yes, I suppose in the answer to that, if the council would like some, uh, some conditions that speak to the limitations on the parking of commercial vehicle, we can certainly include those, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, perhaps I'll discuss this with Mr Russell uh, with a potentially an, an amendment. Thank you, Deputy Thank Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Oh, yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, question for Mr Russell. I'm um, just looking at pages 90 and 91, which are the very exciting um, contour maps of the site. And uh, if I look at um, one particular location, which uh, looks like it's at the, uh, the south. Um, which way around is that? Southwest of the site. Um, I can see from the contour maps, one of which is dated... 
June 2018, and the other one is dated October 2020. It looks like there's about a metre and a half of fill. Uh, I'm just wondering, obviously that predates this application. What's the situation there? Is that, is that, so that amount of fill, does that require a development application? Through Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, in short, yes. So the filling of the land that uh, has been um, detailed in the documentation submitted by the applicant in response to complaints or inquiries by members of the public and council is that, yes, the point in which the gentleman filled the land, whether it was pertinent to the building of his house, which goes beyond the extent of the need to fill for the building of his house, absolutely, that required development approval. He did not, as, as, um, as has been put by one of the um, deputations, he did not seek or apply for approval and no approval was given. The plans that have been submitted now and included in the agenda are the same plans that were originally provided which showed the extant land levels at the point in which this application was lodged. What those plans didn't do, unfortunately, is that the spot levels that allowed someone to identify the nature of the levels of the land from the plan were not included. That has been rectified now in the inclusion of the new site plan which shows the development uh, juxtaposed over the site contours with the levels of those contours depicted. These two plans simply show survey done of the level of the land before the gentleman filled it. So the 18 survey plan is the pre-existing levels of the land. The 2020 survey plan, which is the survey plan that is submitted now with this application and upon which his development proposal is based, uh, with the levels subsequently uh, um, when, when, when the land was filled. Um, council, at this point, with these plans in front of it, will be contemplating the approval, admittedly retrospectively, uh, well, dealing with that component retrospectively, oh, it's already been done, as part of this proposal. Uh, and the salient thing around all of that, I suppose, is, is that the, the question there is, is it goes to the, the question as to the impact of the bulk and scale of the development proposed on the land as its levels are existing, uh, and whether or not that has any adverse impacts on any of the neighbours. That has been contemplated and addressed in the report. Council can quite reasonably, if it's satisfied now with the explanation around the land levels, contemplate an approval of this application with these plans that show those existing levels, which would operate in terms of approving those levels here and now. Thank you. We'll be moving on to the next item. Uh, I'll just note that we've got three deputations that were written on this item, uh, which are listed in your um, uh, papers tonight. If we could recall Councillor Zanino to the Chambers, please. Whilst that's occurring, councillors will be moving to part B of the agenda and I'll just wait for councillors and Nina to come in before I ask the next deputations to come forward. Okay, moving to part B, councillors. The first item is item 3.1, North Allenbrook District Structure Plan. It's on page 109 of your agenda. And uh, deputation by Mr Anthony Rowbottom, who's the manager of Lendlease. So, Mr Rowbottom, once you start speaking, you'll have five minutes, and I'll try and warn you when you have one minute left. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak uh, tonight in support of our proposal for the district structure plan for North Ellenbrook, specifically uh, uh, east of uh, Northlink. Lendlease has a 50-year heritage in delivering master plan communities right across Australia. These are generally projects in excess of 2,000 lots and deliver staged, economic, affordable, sustainable developments for housing areas right across the country. It's with this heritage that we looked at the North Ellenbrook area in uh, support of the government strategy and knowing that there was a looming 
supply constraint in the market. It may seem strange given the amount of land that is supposed to be rezoned, but when you consider the fractured nature of land, it really puts a dent on the ability for developers or for the market to be supplied with affordable, staged projects that keep housing prices in check. And that's something that large projects like master plan projects can do. Just in support of some of our consideration when we looked at investing into this area, we were um, aware of those market analysis. We did independent research and we were uh, familiar with the demand in that area. DPLH also uh, identified its need uh, to provide for the need for more land in that uh, precinct by 2031. Our planning is in support of that. You can't turn these taps on immediately and release land. This is a long-term planning requirement to keep the market in balance. We're fully aware of the need for the interchange in North Ellenbrook, and we're acutely aware of the associated funding uh, obligations. We don't, um, we don't detract from that. We understand those uh, situations. There is no expectation for us to come to the City of Swan to pre-fund the interchange or contribute to the development costs. That's one of the beauties of master plan communities. We can do it in a staged, manufactured way that, to lessen the burden on the City of Swan. Approval of the DSP will not result in the immediate development of a project. It is part of the stage process that we've, we need to go through, as I mentioned. And plus, it's not a fractured land holding in the uh, North Ellenbrook area. It's something that we've got the control over the majority of the area so we can maintain that staged and reliable delivery of the mark, uh, to the market. As I said, we're a leader, world-class leader in the delivery of communities. These provide diverse housing choice, sustainable solutions and activated places, activation that commences from day one. Community wellbeing is also one of our new key principles and we see this as a real chance for us to partner with the City of Swan to deliver a vision and create something special in this area. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Any questions, Councillors? Councillor Henderson. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Obviously, a sticking point at this point is that the interchange. Um, what sort of time frame do you see around uh, that occurring and, and, and how do you see the funding occurring? There's certainly plenty of work uh, to do on the funding, but the DSP is only one part of that process. So we, we, it's something that we can't finalise in the next couple of months, but it's uh, part of that process that we need to go through uh, as the planning journey unfolds. We understand the requirement of that and we're not uh, asking uh, City of Swan for support. I can't give you a definitive timeline, but we understand the need of that, uh, that interchange. Thank you very much for your deputation. I also note Mr Scott Vanson from Lendlease is also in attendance. I'll call on the next deputation, Mr Rod Dixon from the Rowe Group. And Mr Jeremy Cordina is also here from Property Parcel, Parcel Property. Thank you. You'll have five minutes once you start speaking. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm actually Jeremy Cordina, the General Manager of uh, Parcel Property. Um, we represent the uh, owners on the western side of the highway and the Western District Structure Plan that is um, up for approval through Council <clears throat> over the next couple of weeks. To start with, I'd like to just reinforce that we actually agree with the council officer's position in relation to the urban deferred nature uh, of, of this particular uh, area. So we've actually lodged an urban deferred application to the planning commission. Um, and as part of the feedback for that urban deferred application, we were asked to provide additional information. That additional information is provided within the district structure plan that we've lodged and it, it should be noted that in order for us to move to an urban zoning we would need to deal with the um, outstanding items that are currently in front of us today, one of which is the servicing for the, for the area, uh, second is the application of a developer contribution scheme uh, which the DSP is critical 
to enable us to actually uh, outline what the items that go into that DCS would be. And then the final one is the intersection uh, location, funding, uh, and all of the technical detail around that. Um, just to reiterate some of the, the points that um, uh, Lend Lease have made, th this particular uh, stage of the planning process is very uh, early in the piece. There is still a number of layers of planning that need to be undertaken prior to any works occurring on site. And um, uh, beyond the uh, district structure plan approval, we, ex we expect that a, a developer contribution scheme for, for this area will take a number of years. We expect that the urban uh, deferred through to urban will take uh, an extensive period of time. And then beyond that, we still have to do local structure plans and get subdivision approvals. So just to reiterate, this is, this is part of the long term planning for urban uh, supply within Perth Metro uh, and not uh, a short term proposal. Um, that was it for me. Thank you. Uh, questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley. Yes, Mr Cordina, the, um, the outline of the um, structure plan area, is that the property, is that the full holdings of the people you represent? Correct, yes. So that's how it's been determined, that's the, the shape based on, based on the land holdings of the people you represent? So that's the, the shape is based on the um, sub-regional uh, plans put forward by the WAPC and uh, we have been in contact and working with those landowners within that area and outside of that area for an extensive period of time, probably the last 10 years. So is it one, one owner or multiple? No, there's probably about eight landowners, Thank but you. all large landowners. Any other councillors? Then I thank you for your time and your thank presentation. You. Um, item, the next item, councillors, item 3.3, .3, draft heritage assessment of properties nominated in 2020. It's on page two, 329. There is a written deputation by Dr Katie Elliott on 40 Byers Road. I'll just draw your attention to that to make sure you read it. The next items are item 4.1 and 4.2. It's the single house and storage shed additional and associated with the existing poultry farm, Cheltenham Street, Bennett Springs, and the replacement of an existing poultry shed um, at the same premises. It's on page 502 and 567. And the next deputation is Mr Graham Goddard. Thank you, Mr Goddard. Once you start speaking, you'll have five minutes and I'll try and warn you at four. Thanks. Thanks for your time tonight. It just um, really blows me away this one. The other, we've we've sort of had the chook farmer in the area for many years now. The property's been in the family name of my wife and her brother behind me um, for over thirty years, and in all of that time, you know, virtually since '94, they've had a plan to. Um, urban deferred and future urban for housing and the like. Um, Metronet has affected the, the current situation of the farm, which from what I can gather and from what I can read on what's going on there, that uh, the shed number one is to be um, demolished and replaced with a, a new much bigger shed that that allows him to move the, sh the chickens from shed four into shed one and still maintain another one of the sheds that is not demolished for probably more chickens and then build a huge uh, 2,000 square metre factory unit to process his, the rest of his eggs from this farm and other farms, which I've also read the, uh, the court hearing in relation to that issue with the council and I think that when's, <clears throat> when's it become enough is enough you know the, the property if you read the current um, you know environmental code of practices for poultry farms a poultry farm should be 20 hectares minimum and 40 hectares as preferred this one's now down to 1.6 and I don't think any of the codes that would come into play with the the uh, sheds being the distances from the boundaries that are now set on the new block of land that is left over from 
it being lot 505 and the, uh, the, the either end of the property that's been affected by Metronet or the roads for that, um, I just don't think there's enough sustainability to keep it. And certainly more push from, from everything we read from the government and uh, Metronet to go urban. I don't understand why we're holding back. <laughs> At the moment, I don't think he um, he can operate with the the number one shed is the has was approved back in 1982 or three or something for uh, only rearing, uh, which means that it's no good for putting caged eggs in. And two and three that he did have as um, chicken sheds have now been converted to carry on the uh, the. the egg sorting and, and processing or whatever he does in there, um, which only leaves the one shed that uh, is left to house chickens in, and, and that's got to be demolished. So I don't know whether we've actually even got a poultry farm anymore, you know. Uh, and we certainly don't need a, um, a massive shed for processing eggs from somewhere else that is a relative to not having a poultry farm if you're not going to build the, the infrastructure to suit and I think everywhere that you read through the um, the environmental code of practice is that they they want to um, push people away from developing in the Swan catchment area and get it out to Bullsbrook and Gingin and places further down the track that don't affect people. And uh, I think this is a classic example. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Questions, councillors? No questions. Call the next deputation. This is Mr. Alan Stewart from Stewart Urban Planning, representing uh, the Tricolori family. Thank uh, you. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. Yes, I represent the Tricolli family, who live directly to the north of the poultry farm on Cheltenham Street. Uh, we do not support the recommendation of approval, which fails to consider the amenity impacts of the reconfigured poultry farm the urban deferred zoning under the region scheme and the strategic planning initiatives for a residential neighbourhood around the planned Bennett Springs East Railway Station. We disagree with the contention that the application is not intensifying <coughs> an existing poultry farm and is consistent with original approvals. Shed 1 was approved in 1984 as a rearing shed. Shed 4 was approved in 1993 and that was conditional upon two things. The development not exceeding current bird numbers and the confirmation of those bird numbers being provided. The information provided at that time clearly stated that um, shed one would contain 6,000 chickens and sheds two, three and four would each have 6,000 chickens. Uh, whilst that's indeed a total of 24,000, the conditions of approval limit the number of birds in each shed to 6,000. As confirmed by the applicant, sheds two and three are no longer used to house poultry. This means the current approval, approved capacity of the poultry farm is effectively only 12,000, comprising 6,000 in each of sheds one and four. And as the previous speaker said, shed four is no longer on the property, so perhaps it's even less. Um, <clears throat> the application in front of you this evening proposes a new shed where all 24,000 egg-laying chickens will be contained. That's an entirely different proposition to the original approvals for this property many years ago. However, no detailed environmental study has been undertaken to assess the impact of the revised configuration of this poultry farm. The new shed with all 24,000 chickens will be positioned only 80 metres from my client's house, uh, 70 metres from the boundary, but only 80 metres from the actual residence, which will likely intensify adverse impacts such as odour, noise and dust. In the absence of a site-specific buffer definition study, the EPA guidance statement requires a buffer of 300 to 1,000 metres, depending on the size of the poultry farm. Even if you take the lower end of that range, it's evident the buffer cannot be achieved within this property, which is now down to something like 1.6 uh, hectares, if I've got that right. Uh, there's approximately 10 dwellings in the surrounding area within 300 metres of the proposed shed. So within that lower end of the generic buffer when you do not do a proper study to, to support your proposal. Now I note in the agenda item that it states that the application does not increase the total number of poultry. Consideration of other impacts do not arise. The reconfiguration of the poultry farm to locate all 24,000 birds in one shed 
in a location that is even closer to my client size, is not consistent with current approvals and does require impacts such as order to be addressed at this stage. Due to the close pattern of subdivision and the proximity of residential uses, it's highly unlikely <coughs> that any order study could reach this conclusion that the proposal is acceptable. We don't have the study, so I can only guess, but I would find it hard to believe that such an outcome could be achieved. Um, so look, with respect to the urbanisation of this area around a future railway station, the agenda item states that <coughs> this application does not entail any expansion in the number of poultry, which might otherwise constrain capacity for surrounding urban development, as envisioned by the improvement plan, and therefore there's no conflict with that plan. This fails to recognise that even at its current size, the poultry farm is already constraining the capacity of surrounding, for surrounding urban development. This is very obvious from the boundary of the region scheme urban zone and the local scheme residential development zone. And these are, that's evident on the maps on pages 586 and 587 of your agenda. The zoning maps are there. The urban you deferred, have one minute left, thank sure, you. Sure, thank you. The urban deferred and rural zonings have been retained in the area around the poultry farm. And if it were not for this poultry farm, the entire area would already be zoned urban. Uh, the proposed reconfiguration of the poultry farm rep represents a new application that is clearly at odds with the proposed urbanisation of the area. The improvement cl plan includes a number of objectives for the future improvement scheme, which is to integrate development with the railway station and to establish a contemporary transit oriented development in this area. The application in front of you this evening clearly conflicts with these objectives and if it's approved, will prevent the strategic planning outcomes for this area from being achieved. So I believe the correct position for Council on this matter is to advise the Planning Commission that it does not support either of these applications. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, councillors? Councillor uh, Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, just a quick question. Um, you represent the, the neighbours uh, closest then. Uh, you talked about the 300 metre to 1,000 square metre buffer zone. Mm. If it can't be achieved within that, what would be the minimum that they could achieve? Well, the 300 to 1,000 metres is the generic buffer distance that the EPA guidance statement recommends for a poultry farm when there is no site-specific study done. So, and in this case, there isn't one. Um, so the absolute minimum would have to be 300 metres under that generic recommended distance. And my client's property house is only 80 metres away and there's nine others within that 300 metre distance. Thank you. Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I'd just like to ask you um, the property address of the um, Trickley family. Oh, it's, is that, <laughs> Sorry, no, it's uh, 62 it's number or? 62 Cheltenham yeah, Street. Yeah, directly yes. north of yeah. the property. Thank you. Councillor Carley. Uh, yes, can I ask, in relation to the people you represent, the, uh, the neighbours, if they were to build a house to the north of where they currently live, would that be permitted? Um, well, yes, they could build a single house. Uh, or if they were to build a row of terraces or... I don't think they could do that because it's still presently zoned general rural, but you could have one single house on the property. Uh, but, yeah, would they be able to build other uh, residences on the same lot to the north, would they be restricted? It might be something from staff. Yeah, it might them. be something for Mr. Russell to confirm. Yeah, I think my, so. My, off the top of my head, it's zone general rural and one house per lot in the rural zone is the yeah. requirement. What, what I'm interested in is the restrictions placed on neighbour, neighbouring uh, neighbours, neighbouring properties, in terms of what they can do on their property, um, as opposed to what the applicant can can achieve by moving or moving. Uh, buildings on the same lot, um, well, I'm just wondering if the same restrictions apply to the neighbours as would apply to, or, or re the same restrictions that apply to the neighbours would apply to the applicant, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm sorry it doesn't make sense no, to me. Um, I think it's one if, for Mr it, Russell. Yeah, later. sorry, apologies. But, I mean, if it was urban development zoning, um, it would be a entirely different proposition well, as to what we could Deal with staff develop. questions at the end of the other deputations. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. I think I understand <laughs> the train of... Uh, Oh, you want, to, you want me to wait for... Yeah. I'll, I'll wait I'll, for the other, I'll beg you. other deputation and then we'll deal with staff questions. So thank you for your deputation. Um, the next deputation is by Mrs Amanda Butterworth in support and uh, representing the owner-applicant. Thank you, Ms Butterworth. You'll have five minutes. Thank you. Um, we support the officer's um, 
recommendation of approval regarding both applications at 4.1 and 4.2, and this deputation relates to both of those applications. The site's operated as a poultry farm since 1979, with all existing buildings on site having planning approval, with the most recent planning approval having been granted in 2013 by WAPC, and I think it was 2012 by the City, which approved a number of the existing buildings on site associated with the ongoing operations of the poultry farm. As outlined in the officer report, the landowner is not seeking to expand operations. The WAPC has acquired land associated with the Ellenbrook railway line, which has resulted in the existing dwelling and two of the sheds being, sorry, three of the sheds being subject um, of these applications, which have to be demolished. Sorry, two new sheds, three of the existing sheds are within land that is to be um, resumed. As a result, buildings wholly or partly within the land being resumed will all need to be demolished. The application simply seeks to replace what presently exists. We consider that when the State Government acquires land, it's reasonable to request to be able to simply replace those buildings that will be demolished as a result of that resumption. We support the officer recommendation and the general intent of the conditions as outlined in the officer report. However, we do seek review of um, certain conditions, which is condition one on both approvals, and condition 16 for item 4.1 and condition eight for 4.2, um, which restricts that those conditions 16 and eight seeks to restrict delivery times for the site. In regard to condition one on both of the approvals, it requires that um, approval has to comply with the attached plans. It's the statutory requirement that a landowner proceeds with development in accordance with approved plans. Um, as such, we consider that it's unnecessary to impose a condition um, whereby you're, you have to comply with um, the approved plans in any event. However, condition one uses the words must comply in all respects. We consider this to be unreasonable in that if we were to, say for example, um, move a window or an opening to one of the sheds, for example, um, condition one would not permit this minor alteration to the building in that it wouldn't comply in all respects to the approved plans. On that basis, we simply request deletion of um, condition one on both recommendations or at the least deletion of the words must comply in all respects. This would then allow officers to have delegated authority perhaps to then deal with any minor modifications. Recommendations, sorry, recommended condition 16 for item 4.1 and condition 8 for 4.2 seeks to restrict delivery times to the site and the recommended condition um, reads the same for both of those um, items. We seek review of the condition to insert the words um, that delivery vehicles to the shed subject of this application are not permitted to enter the site between those hours. Um, we request this on the basis that there is an existing operation that has approval to um, for buildings that are not subject of this application to have deliveries outside this time. So we accept that it would relate to the building subject of this application and we'd happily um, support that revised conditions to limit those delivery vehicles to the shed subject of the application um, not being permitted to enter the site outside the hours of 7am to 7pm Monday to Saturday and 9am to 5pm Sundays and public yeah, holidays. Yeah, one minute left, thank you. Thank you. Um, we respectfully ask that the Council support the officer recommendations subject to these um, modifications. I also have Mr Barry Cocking, a Director of the Landowner in attendance, and if um, you have any questions for myself or Barry, we'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank Deputy you. Mayor. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, it might be a question for Mr Cocking, I'm not sure, mm. but it's, um, I want to know what the current operating capacity is, how long it's been operating in that capacity and when those um, other sheds close down. Do you know the, uh, the current operating capacity, for, if I can, through Mr Mayor, um, for, in terms of the number of chickens? Exactly. Yeah. 24,000 chickens. There's currently 24,000 chickens. Yes. Oh, it's just that, the, sorry, the, um, the previous speaker. 
has yes. said that there's currently only about 6,000 chickens. No, there's, there's 24,000 chickens on site oh. presently, and that's in accordance with the, oh, the maximum 24,000. I must have misunderstood 24, the previous deputy. Sorry. That's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Kiley. Just a general question. Um, it might be the applicant wants to answer it. Is there, is there a stage or a point at um, any time where the applicant would see himself wanting to move ship, shift operations to another location? Or what, what would be the trigger for that move if, the, if it ever came about? Um, through Deputy Mayor, it may be best off that Mr Cocking do answer, does answer that question. Um, however, in terms of the operations, it is intended to stay on site and continue those operations in accordance with the, um, you know, the, the approvals at the moment with the 24,000 chickens. So at this stage, I'd say that, yeah, that, that with continuing to operate with the 24,000 chickens that would stay there um, indefinitely. Um, I don't believe that there's a time frame at all to, to move, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your deputation. Thank you. You also note that both uh, deputies made written submissions also, councillors. Any uh, questions of staff on that item? No, we'll move to the next item, which is item 4.5, uh, amendment aspects, the development approval, uh, alterations, additions of existing dwelling at uh, James Street, Guildford. It's on page 680. Councillor Richards declared a financial interest and is leaving the chambers. I have five in-person deputations. I've been advised that the uh, order may be changed, so I'm not sure who's coming to the microphone first, but uh, once Councillor Richardson has, has left the table, if those people wanting to make a deputation, have you got your order sorted out? If you can just state your name when you come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. If you can state your name, and you'll have five minutes once you start speaking. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Danielle Zanetti and I currently reside in Hubert Street, Guildford and am an owner of a true loft conversion renovation. I object to the recommendation from the City of Swan regarding the proposed planning application at 77 James Street, Guildford. We would like it to be noted that we have a concern that there is a potential con conflict of interest as there is sensitivity to the homeowner being a councillor here. We would also like it noted that the planning officer for this proposal was unavailable to prior to submission, and we have only had a limited time of two days to respond to the details of this proposal and have not been able to contact him with our concerns. We have also had previous times when we have had mere days to respond to the extensive amendments and when questioning the planning department, they have blamed it on either Australia Post or COVID. Yet other residents have had weeks for neighbour objection, so we find there's two vast inconsistencies within this department. I would like to refer you to page 683, the details of the proposal, where it states, it should be noted the construction of these works has already commenced on site. These works being a replacement of the approved balcony, sorry, these works being a replacement of the approved veranda to the rear, south elevation of the dwelling, with a new veranda with a balcony addition and balustrade above, and a French door that will replace a previously approved dormer window that will provide access to the loft area and proposed balcony. These modifications all commenced without any of the City of Swan approvals. Councillor Richardson was voted in to represent the ratepayers of the Pierce Ward. With receiving a position within the local community, some of the attributes you would expect a councillor to have would be advocacy, negotiation, leadership, guidance and integrity. As um, a councillor, we Mr. would have Nettie, thought... I'm just going to stop you there. I'm not sure if you're in the chamber when I open the meeting, but no. I'll just uh, ask you to make sure that comments aren't uh, derogatory uh, uh, to any council. I'll just read the last sentence of my opening remarks. So, uh, people making deputations, uh, please keep your comments respectful to council and other members of the public. I'll just warn you now, I've, I've told, I don't think you've stepped over the line, but I'd ask you not to make any um, more derogatory comments. Not making anything Thank derogatory, you. sir. Uh, so as being privy to the processes, rules and regulations, we would assume that this would have been that these would have been approved of before the commencement of work and only would have proceeded with construction when they have, would have been approved by the planning and building authorities. 
In starting construction before approvals have been handed, surely there is some form of penalty. Does this subject the homeowners to the same penalties that other neighbours have had? If we can submit alterations in after the fact we have started to build something, does this not undermine the whole process? If nothing is going to be done about this, then there, is there any need for a planning application, planning approval at all? At times it feels that the City of Swan has rules for some and rules for others. I also object to the exterior wall change. The City of Swan local planning policy, Guildford Conservation Precinct, Precinct 6.1.5, states extension is supposed to be sympathetic and distinguishable to the original. The City of Swan recommending the approval of the render to be taken off the original building will make it difficult to distinguish between the original and the new buildings. This is your policy in regards to a heritage area of Western Australia. If we are not able to adhere to the policies that you set and they can be twisted to adapt to the needs of owners, that once again, is there any need for the policy in the first place? In conclusion, I enjoy living in the area and all it has to offer. Guildford has a unique beauty of being rich in history and being sympathetic to its surroundings. If we continue to flaunt policies that are in place to protect Guildford and the community that we live in, then what is the point of these policies at all? Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? No questions, and I'll ask the next deputation to come forward and state your name. Any more deputations on this item? Thank you. Because you've changed the order, I'm not sure who I'm addressing, so if you can just state your name and I'll tick you off. Yeah, Peter Dolan, homeowner, 79 James Street. Thank you. So uh, I'm resending my objection, asking the question of City of Swan and uh, the relevant decision maker to review. Some of the sections in the R codes are 2.3 through to 2.32 regarding consultation procedures. Uh, I'll also add in the 7.1 on the Visual Policy and uh, Privacy Act. Um, it's a little bit saddening that three times it's passed through and uh, with no consultation being a direct uh, neighbour to the house. Um, can I ask uh, when was the study done and the affected neighbours and to what extent? Uh, what was the outcome from the previous issues and where is the follow-up consultation? Would the decision maker consider the immediate and long-term effect of adjacent homeowners and their wellbeing? As the homeowner, I see the balcony not only as a complete invasion of my family's privacy, but also the effect that we have on our day-to-day -day living. This is a long-term effect with young children. I do believe that no amount of screening to the west will compensate for the full exposure of the balcony on the southern side. This will still allow them to have full view of my backyard every day, invading my home. The Aussie dream, the backyard. I would also ask that you picture yourself in the same position, hanging your clothes on the line, your wife, your young girls. Is there any other loft conversion balcony extensions that have been approved in Guildford Precinct without being considered a two-storey building? Uh, regarding the pool gazebo, what is the code for the density in relation to all the additions currently? Is there, is there a ruling regarding enclosed spaces inside a pool area? Uh, consideration taking on to the uh, actual um, windows, uh, no mention of frosting. Uh, the point is basically why are the windows being overlooked. You know, again, I, I steer my, I steer my direction towards the consultation of the neighbours. Would you like someone looking through a window at your yard, your children, your wife? Um, the boundary fence. There's no detail showing the footings for the pillars. There's no other sandstone pillars in the street. What size are they? What thickness is the wall? Does the fence comply with the six metre setback ruling regard, uh, regarding truncations? Referring to the main roads uh, of Western Australia ruling. I recently went through a long, long term submission trying to get my fence over the line. The driveway will have to identify a truncation of one and a half metres each way. The setbacks to be in is it to be in alignment with the original building or not the new addition? 
Was there an existing double size opening gate there to begin with and what size? Again, your submission states, noted some of these works have commenced already. And what action has been taken in regards to compliance or are these permissible, permissible offences? As I was also approached many times doing works at my property. Also, the referral of recommendations from the Heritage Council, is that considered as a sign of approval or is it just a recommendation? All in all, as you can probably hear the nervousness in my voice as I talk, the privacy that I have in my home is for my home and my family. With a balcony overlooking, I really would not appreciate that. It would change the effect of the way we live our lives every day. So I object to the balcony. I object to all the other things that keep getting added on and on and on continuously. You have one minute left, thank you. No worries. That's all I've got to say. Okay, questions, councillors. Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Thanks for coming in for your deputation. I'd just like to ask you um, what the height is of your fence. Yeah, sure. 1.8 metres. So it's 1.8 metres along Hubert Street. Correct, yeah. 5% fall yep. from the garage. Okay. And so there's... Oh, I've just got a picture of a mature tree along the side of Hubert Street, which mm. is said to block the view into any of your property. Sure. Do you dispute that? I dispute that. Uh, you are uh, of our ward, I believe. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'll invite you to come to my house in my backyard and view it for yourself sure, if you like. Sure, of course. I'm happy to. Because I've seen you around, so yeah. no problem. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, councillors. Then I thank you for your deputation and ask the next speaker to come forward, please. Once you come to the microphone, if you could just state your name and then you'll have five minutes from when you start speaking. Thank you. I'm not quite tall enough for this. Just Hi, you um, can bend it down. My name's Judy Scorer and I live at um, 22 Hubert Street, which is um, the, uh, a, the Richardson's back fence is my driveway fence. So all these um, proposed amendments are on my back fence, are on my side fence which means that um, I'm not going to be able to see anything. I'm going to become a mushroom. I'm basically um, protest um, objecting to the carport because if that's built where it's built and it, to the height that it's built, um, that will block off, that will take the sun from 90% of my driveway um, to the beginning of my home. Um, if the gazebo, and it's not a gazebo incidentally, a gazebo doesn't have walls. So this is a room that's being built at the pool. If that's built, that comes from my front door up and I'll have two and a half metres in which there will be a pool pump and I understand four trees of some sort screening. So I've got the balcony looking right in my lounge room. I've got um, a carport and I've got a gazebo and I've got four trees. Guys, I don't know if you know what it's going to be like, but it's not going to be fun. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit... Um, I'm a little bit cross and upset about it. I've lived there for 20 years and I've enjoyed living there. I haven't the last couple of years. Um, the, the guys next door um, asked for a, a loft extension. This is Danny and her husband. And we agreed because a loft extension doesn't extend the, the height of the roof, doesn't extend it at all. That was done six weeks, done and dusted, and it was fabulous. The people on the other side applied for a loft extension and we thought, oh, OK, that's going to be fine. So we said, yeah, go for a loft extension. And the roof went up almost two metres. And I said to the Shire, that's not right. That's not a loft extension. That's another story. And nothing was done. Nothing was done. Everybody said, oh, that's somebody else's department. So I don't know. I'm a little bit at a loss. Um, um, the pool pump, um, well, that, that's, the pool pump just about makes my life in my lounge room unbearable. 
because it, it goes quite often during the day and the night. Um, and I sit in my lounge room. So the, I've got the distance of a driveway between the pool pump, the pool, what's going to be a gazebo, and, and my TV. So I'm afraid I object to all of these things, absolutely all of them. The balcony and the French doors I object to really strongly, and I can't tell you... Um, I can't state strongly enough about about how I feel having somebody constantly looking at me um, in my front yard. Pete's got it in his backyard with his little girls. I've got it in my front yard and they can actually see in the daytime into my lounge room. So unless I keep my blinds closed at all times, that's what I'm stuck with. So I really hope that you reconsider and um, do not allow these things to go through. That's all really I've got to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Sorry. Any questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley. Thank you. I've, you've got a few points there. I just want to quick ask if you could quickly go over the concerns. Is the, it's the viewing over into, from the balcony into the yard, I gather? It comes... The, the balcony's there and my lounge room has an L-shaped window and it looks straight in, straight in, over the fence and straight in. Right, so that's that's one concern. There was the pool pump and just want to check on a few others. That's anything else, more the viewing from the balcony well, in? I, I, I don't know about the... I'm going to have absolutely no sunlight, none at all, because if the... If the um, gazebo is built to the height it's going to be built and the carport to the height it's going to be built and then I'm going to have trees screening, I'm going to have absolutely no sun um, from about 10 o'clock in the morning. Right, OK. Um, mm. so, sun, so sun is an issue looking in... Do you understand in, what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I can I sort of get what you're saying, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Oh, there's just one other thing that I thought of. Keep going. Um, the, the carport's going to be bought back 1.3 metres, um, but the height of the fence, my side, is 1.7. And um, I noted that it, apparently somebody spoke to me about um, my inability to see round the corner, so the result is that the height of the fence is going to be increased now to 2.2 metres. I don't get that one either. Thank Thanks, guys. OK, thank you. And I believe there's one more um, speaker against, if that person could come forward. Uh, it should be Mr Kitchener, I believe. Hi, my, my name is Daryl Kitchener. Thank you. You've got five at, minutes. Yes, I won't need that. I, I live at 18 Hubert Street, which is just down the road. Uh, the previous four speakers have... Um, <coughs> have concentrated on uh, a number of issues of style, shape, form, um, security. Nobody's really mentioned at this point the impact of this extension and the things under and the additional amendments under discussion tonight on the streetscape values. Uh, Hubert Street is on the edge of the old historic precinct. And this is a sentinel house as you turn from the main street into Hubert Street. It is right on the corner. It was a fine old home. It's been bastardised. It's totally changed in shape. The extension is not a loft extension. It's a two-storey extension in exposed brick. The proposal is to remove the, uh, the, the, the um, veneer on the existing old house to expose the brick again, making it even more difficult to see the extension from the original house, which is the antithesis of what uh, is, is requested by this council to maintain heritage values. The streetscape is also impacted by um, everything that's been mentioned Previously, the new large fence, which is supposed to have pillars of 1.825, uh, 
uh, metres uh, when, in fact, the regulations say side streets should not be more than 1.2 metres and it's the construct, the material. Uh, there is nothing else like that in the street. And yet opposite, I have two neighbours. One received a threat of a $50,000 fine if he didn't put his little normal white picket fence back up without approval from the Shire. So what are we conforming to here? I think this house makes a mockery of your intent to maintain heritage values. It breaches so many of the regulations. The loft extension generally is an agreement. What does that, what in the hell does that mean generally? You're either agreeing with the regulations or you're not. And if you're not, and there's been a compliance survey, what are the consequences of that? We don't know. Yet everyone else in the street has been hammered by such restrictions, and I agree with them. My house is a little 1882 workers' college, uh, cottage. I'm surrounded on either side by these huge extensions, but they don't affect the streetscape. They fit in, and my neighbours discussed it with me beforehand. That has not been the case here. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you. Just if you hold on for a second, thanks, Mr Kitchen. Any questions, councillors? There are no questions, and I thank you for your deputation. Any questions of staff on this item? Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I've got some questions. Let me just go back. Um, in, um, I think, uh, the first deputation, there was some talk about um, uh, retrospective applications. Can Mr Russell advise us, uh, are there any penalties for retrospective applications? Through Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes, there's a nominally something in the order of a five hundred thousand, uh, not five hundred, five hundred dollar. Well, you could make it five hundred thousand, I suppose. A five hundred dollar penalty fee, which is generally a deterrent or sought to be a deterrent to stop people from doing something first and applying subsequently. They can still apply subsequently, but there needs to be a deterrent, and there is one. All right. Is that something new? <laughs> Mayor, uh, no, it's been around for a while. Okay. Fair That's my first question. Um, and then Mr Peter Dolan asked about what action has been taken with regard to compliance. I think that's one to Mr Russell again. Mr Russell. <clears throat> Through Mr Deputy Mayor, I think the important thing that we need to understand here is, and if you go to page 684, the genesis, the original, this is all, this is in the nature of the third revision or modification to an original approval granted by this council in 2018 for part demolition, alterations addition to the existing dwelling including a loft conversion. So uh, Mr Deputy Mayor Councillors, please, as I'm sure you won't, don't labour under a misapprehension around worry, de, de, contemplating the nature of the loft conversion. It has been done and dusted by this council. Now in relation to that it is under the regulations, it's open for an applicant once an approval has been issued at any point subsequent to that to apply for modifications. And this is what's occurred here. Now, if the question there is, is that at what point is the development at the present time in any way non compliant? Myself and the executive manager of planning, uh, most recently and just several hours ago, preparatory to this meeting, did a quick inspection to ascertain the state of play of the development on the ground. And the only thing that has occurred is that they have placed in the middle dormer window, which was provided for under the original approval, that has been extended to an opening preparatory for the imposition of the French door to open out onto the proposed balcony. But there is no balcony there. There is no scaffolding around that or anything. So that is the extent uh, in terms of... So largely, OK, the applicant has, to be fair, has checked to see around uh, ascertaining at what point they can proceed with works under the original approval and at what point any departures then become 
necessary to have a modification in. And we're quite comfortable with the state of play with respect to what they've applied for, what they've already done, which they have approval <coughs> for, and what they haven't done, which is what they're proposing. Thank you. Sorry, I've jumped the gun a bit. There's one more deputation, and that's from the owner, Mr Richardson. So I might hear from him, and then we'll continue with staff questions. So I'll call Mr Richardson to the podium, and once again, you'll have five minutes, and I'll try and warn you when you have a minute left. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, the councillors, city staff. Thank you for giving me the chance to um, support my changes and um, address... Uh, the uh, objections and, quite frankly, outrageous claims. The balcony. Oh, before I start, I, I understand that you may have uh, been given a copy of this, just a, a brief summary of uh, my response, so I'll quickly just go over this as I only have five minutes. The balcony proposal was a late amendment, but we did contact the city before the work commenced and... Uh, sought um, information with regards to the setbacks, um, the overviewing and the codes, the building codes around the change. At the time of the phone call, it was a positive outcome and we was in a position where we needed to um, make a decision whether we carry on with the um, uh, uh, glazed uh, window in the middle dormer or we put the doorway there to um, move on with the amendments that we sought. Um, this, this balcony serves two purposes. Firstly, it makes maintenance of the windows, dormers, gutters, fascias much more easily accessible than trying to um, access them over the top of uh, Borno's veranda. It allows us also to recover some of the area lost in our yard due to the ongoing problem of um, street parking in, the, in Hubert Street. I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, most weekends it's very difficult to get a park in Hubert Street at, at, outside our house. So we have sought to use our backyard to be able to park two vehicles off the road to... Um, alleviate the problem that we're experiencing. Now with that said, we are trying to make up some, some uh, area of land by using this balcony area to be able to have some sort of open space available to us. In relation to the privacy views from the balcony, from our point of view, the vistas that we're trying to capture as well are of the hills, the Perth hills to the uh, east of the property. At the moment, 79 James Street, to the west of the property, doesn't use their driveway. They park on Hubert Street, causing a further problem. Also, 81, 82 James Street, the houses and shop either side park in Hubert Street. So it does get very busy during peak times. Mr Doolan, 79 James Street, is concerned we'll be looking into the, the yard. We have mature trees already established in this area and we have offered and we have consulted them in the street in a heated debate which we, we sought to try and come to some amendment or amends but unfortunately, nobody was willing to negotiate. So this is why we're here today. It's basically we proposed what we could do to satisfy them, but they would not give any indication of what we could do. So basically, with in mind that we've already approached the council, asking them would this be approved or what the likelihood of it being approved or would it be supported, we progressed with that doorway and we haven't built the balcony. The balcony's not there at all. The veranda posts are there, but they form part of the original approved DA. That, and that's basically what we will go back to if we have to and it doesn't get approved next week. You have one minute left, thank you. I'll move on to uh, 
as you've already got a copy item two the building is not a two-story conversion it's impossible that it can be a two-story conversion the wall height on the on the uh, attic level is only 1.5 meters you can't physically walk to be a two-story development it needs to be at least minimum 2.2 meters high then the roof protruding above that this is not the case the case here is it's a 1.5 meter parapet from the from the floor level and then the roof is basically gabled from that point and we sought to place skylights in there which is in keeping with the area as um, house number um, uh, 20 Hubert Street already has skylights which are incidentally looking into our rear yard and they also have a dormer on the opposite side Thank you, Mr. Richardson. That's your a lot of time. Okay. Are there any questions? Thank you, councillors. Councillor Kylie first. Sorry, Mr. Richardson. You've got some. You've got some questions that councillors wish to ask. Uh, thanks, Mr. Richardson. Um, in the uh, the handout you gave, you've you've shown other examples where. Uh, well, you've given other examples that align with the design you've got for your house, but I don't see one there that that shows a balcony similar to what you're proposing. Do you know if there's any one, any balcony like that in the area? Yes, there is. There's, um, there's a balcony on um, Birdie Street. There's a balcony on Helena Street. Um, I can give you the numbers. I think it's 33 Helena Street. Um, the Birdie Street one I can't recall, but it's the end house. I think it's like a number five or something like that, the, the radices. Um, You've got a balcony yourself, sir, I think, as well. So. Yeah. I do. Um, but but I'll point out that it's not in proximity to people's properties as this one yeah. might be. Thanks very much, Dan, for that. Okay. Um, I also want to know... I'll have a look at 5 Birdie and 33 Helena, you said. Yep. I also want to know um, the uh, use of um, sandstone for a wall. Would you be amenable to changing that to um, brick? I wouldn't rule it out at the moment, but um, I will say there is a precedence in Guildford for sandstone Victorian pillars, and I believe the policy is incorrect in how it's actually been worded, that sandstone was a commonly used material in the Victorian period, and sandstone Victorian pillars are widely used throughout the Perth CBD, and there's homes within Guildford on Swan Street, there's a house there that has painted sandstone pillars and even Stirling Square that hold the raw iron gates up. They are rock face sandstone pillars. Thank you, Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you for the deputation. I just want to touch on a couple of things raised in the other deputations. And one's the pool pump noise. Um, could you look at the settings of the pool pump and not have them on at night to reduce the noise? I'd like to just clarify and state this. My pool pump does not run beyond 5 p.m. OK, great. And um, also, considering the overshadowing casting on your neighbours behind you, um, could you change the design, the, the roof height, pitch, etc., of the gazebo and the carport, which will overshadow her property? We can uh, look at changing the design. I have to say, though, I, I can't believe it would overshadow because it's lower. It would be lower than uh, Mr Doolan's house, which would block the sun at that level. Could you, um, would it be possible to provide staff with um, shadowing diagrams? Uh, possibly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll ask staff afterwards about that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, councillors? Then I thank you for your deputation, uh, Mr Richardson. Thank you. And we'll go back to uh, staff questions. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. Uh, yeah, my question's following on from um, uh, the question that uh, uh, Councillor Scallon just had about solar access. Um, uh, I think Mr Miss Judy Scorer at 22 Hubert Street had a question about um, solar access, well, I had a comment about solar access and my question would be, is that a relevant planning consideration given that the carport and the gazebo are right against the uh, uh, sort of fence uh, blocking uh, solar access? Mr Russell. Through Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, I 
I wasn't certain whether Ms Scorer, in talking about overshadowing, was referencing her comments to the carport or whether it was to the gazebo or perhaps it was to both. But certainly in relation to the carport, the carport, to the extent it would cast a shadow southwards across Ms Scorer's property, will be overshadowing a driveway. Now, in a planning context, when we consider the implications of overshadowing, there's a couple of things that we're looking at. One, the reference point is to overshadowing from a north-situated development on a south-situated development, the purpose of which is to consider overshadowing uh, at midwinter's day, which in the southern hemisphere is the 21st of June, midday. And that is the frame of reference in terms of considering overshadowing. And when we consider overshadowing, we're considering the impact of what is being overshadowed. And the value placed on the preservation of amenity from overshadowing is placed in regards to outdoor living areas and habitable spaces. The driveway is no such uh, area. It's not habited. So to the extent that the carport might overshadow Ms Scorer's um, driveway, it is respectfully of no planning consequence for the council to consider here. With respect to the gazebo, what you'll observe with the gazebo is that the gazebo is a structure, and I think some reference was made to how tall it will be, and council, as you will reference the dimensions of the gazebo and the plans. The gazebo has a roof height of about four metres and a wall height of about 2.7 metres, which is a normal plate height. Uh, although somewhat perhaps shorter in Guildford where we talk about plate heights of three metres. But nonetheless, and it's situated in the corner, the south uh, eastern corner of this rectangular north facing lot. And you can see from the aerials that it's actually situated in the corner of the, uh, of the walls there abutting a structure on the adjoining property to the east, which I believe is Mr Dolan's property, as well as um, a patio structure or roof structure uh, immediately adjacent on Miss Scorers. So what we tend to find there when you're talking about buildings on the boundary, commonly like parapet walls, one of the exemptions of the R codes is if you abut, if you have a structure and a wall on a boundary that abuts a like structure, then it's deemed to comply. Because of course one structure up against another structure isn't going to have any overshadowing implications. And that's the logic. So in regards to those concerns here, that has been the point of assessment that we found in the report. The siting this gazebo in a corner of the lot, adjacent and abutting other like structures, ought to have no or minimal implications with respect to overshadowing. And such as they were implications, they would only be relevant if you're overshadowing a habitable area. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Any more questions, Councillor Johnson? Just one more, Mr Mayor, and uh, I think uh, Ms Scorer also mentioned the pool pump. Uh, what steps could uh, Ms Scorer take with regard to pool pump noise? Thank you, Mr Russell. Through you, Mr Mayor, if, I, if you'll allow me the indulgence to perhaps focus Council's attention to the matter at hand and perhaps what is not the matter, Mr Deputy Mayor. There is nothing, forgive me, in this application that relates to a pool pump. I'm not, and I'm saying that, I don't mean to make light of the concern of Ms Scorer. If there is a concern with the noise from the pool pump, then by all means Ms Scorer can address the matter as a complaint with respect to the Environmental Protection Noise Regulations and there are other staff in the city that will duly attend to that. It is not in front of us as a planning concern and I'm loath to perhaps to, to not bring Council's attention to the fact it shouldn't distract itself with the application at hand with an extraneous separate matter that's unrelated, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Cole, you are next. No, Councillor Scanlon. Councillor Parry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. If you don't mind directing this to Mr Russell. Um, quick question for you. I haven't seen it in the report. Has the Guildford Association provided a comment to this, to this item? Because it's mentioned in Mr Richardson's comment that both the Guildford Association and the Guildford Historical Society have expressed their amazement with what we've accomplished. Has there been any response from them? Let me be precise in this response, Mr Mayor. 
I don't doubt for a second that, they, that, that those comments may have been directed to Mr Richardson and the applicant, but the point of fact is, is that we did write to the Guildford Association on two occasions and we've received no record of response, which isn't to say what has just been said about the application by those agencies isn't true, but not to our record. So that's on Mr Richardson's position's third last paragraph above its name, so that paragraph there, Mr Councillor Cole. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. The question is probably to Mr Coton in the first instance. The um, existing crossover is for a single vehicle, by the look of things. Um, uh, the, the dual garage, would that take additional crossover space? It looks like it does on the, the plans, and, and would that effectively reduce the Hubert Street parking? Oh, sorry, I'd have to I'd take that on notice. Okay, so another question then in, in regard to that is um, to alleviate the points made about parking in Hubert Street. Um, can the city uh, develop a policy around um, resident parking permits or do we have those? Because in some councils you can actually have a permit to park in the street, particularly like this where it's such a... A tight town and there's not, not space for a lot of cars. Uh, there's a report coming to council, a couple of reports coming in the near future on implementation of the Guildford parking strategy and it's not proposed to have parking permits for residents but that will come to council. Uh, Councillor Parry again, sorry. I'd have a few fo another follow-up question. Um, we haven't provide, been provided any reason whatsoever by the Guildford Association why they haven't provided a response, have we? Mr. Russell. Any other questions, councillors? Then I just uh, draw your attention. There are also three written deputations on that same item. And before we go to the next item, can we please recall Councillor Richardson? Thank you. Thank you, Council. We'll be moving on to the next item, item 4.6, a proposed amendment to amend the provision pertaining to additional use of the planning scheme um, by adding garden centre as a further additional use for Stirling Street, Guildford. It's on page 713. And the first deputation is Mr Michael Noonan. Thank you, Mr Noonan. You'll have five minutes, and I'll try and give you a warning at the four-minute time. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, Kim and I would like to thank firstly yourself and the councillors, CEO and council officers for the opportunity to speak tonight about our application for an additional use for our building being the Guildford Post Office. Uh, Kim and I have operated our garden design centre now for the last nine years with the full knowledge and in our opinion the tacit approval of the city and we are pleased at last the additional use we proposed nine years ago is now before council for consideration. The history of our experience with respect to approvals may be known to several councillors here tonight. However, I am more than happy to answer any questions on that history and our submissions that we've made to achieve approval after my presentation. Uh, we've been overwhelmed with the acceptance and encouragement from both the local community and the many and varied visitors to the Guildford town during the activation of the post office by means of our uh, garden design centre and cafe. We note with the support of the officers recommending approval of the additional use and further confirming that the amendment proposed is consistent with the aims of the Local Planning Scheme 17 and specifically uh, the points in encouraging development to strengthen the economic base of the district and the provision of local employment, which we're very happy to be uh, part of, the protection of places of a particular natural, architectural or cultural significance, uh, the compliance with relevant state planning authorities uh, policies, oh, sorry, and a contribution to the conservation of the firm, former post office building, and the proposed amendment will not have any adverse impact on the amenity of the surrounding residential area. We also note in the officer's report that parking for the development was addressed within the approval of the cafe. 
We note from our reading of the City of Swan strategic plan that the development we are implementing is synchronised with elements of both the Corporate Business Plan of 2020 and the Strategic Community Plan 2021-31, which are informed by the community and adopted by this Council. There is much more that needs to be done to ensure this unique building is protected for future generations and we are confident we are the right people to continue this important work. This can only be supported by commercial activities. It was always our plan to provide an experience for our customers by developing an integrated business which would achieve several measures which Kim and I believe are important to the successful activation of this heritage listed place. Some of these measures include for us to be in a position to provide sound horticultural advice to our customers, provide a range of high quality garden furniture and antiques for sale, to retail a range of plants that based on our combined 60 years of horticultural experience we know will work in the Guildford and the Hills area. We uh, uh, also have as a, one of our measures the press, pro, progressive restoration of the place, focusing on projects that provide a measurable outcome for Guildford residents. One example of this is the restoration of the 120-year-old manually operated clock, which sits at the top of the third floor of our building. This clock and chiming bell provide a significant community benefit by assisting in the identification and development of the heart of Guildford within the Guildford Heritage Precinct. The last measure we wanted to mention was that we want our residents and customers to experience a part of our history while, achieve, while having the opportunity to enjoy quality food, coffee and tea and a unique garden setting. The last nine years of our experience in operating firstly the Garden Design Centre and then the cafe has proven that the two portions of the post business are necessary for financial success and it was this business plan that we initially pitched to the city and for which we received such a positive reception at the time. Now we do understand that there may be a few in our community who are opposed to what we are doing. Kim and I feel that this may be due to some, not, some people not fully understanding the extent of works undertaken by us in activating the place and they may not be fully informed on the history of our ownership of the building and our ongoing efforts to achieve the required approvals to operate on this site. You have one minute, thank you. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. The approval from you, our councillors, for our application for this additional use will allow the Garden Centre and the Cafe Post to coexist and we trust will assist in alleviating the concerns of a few. We'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you. Questions, councillors? Councillor Scanlon. Mr Deputy Mayor, thank you, Mr Noon, for coming in. Um, I'd just like to ask you mm. what the the cafe portion of the business, what is the seating capacity? Um, I don't have that exact number. Okay. We cater for 35 to 40 people at a time. Okay. I know what you're uh, building towards. The I number. wanted to ask about the parking. Uh, well, I was yes. going to talk about the seating firstly, then we'll okay. talk about the parking. Yep. Uh, what we find in practice is that the customer base we've got will use the external spaces of the garden centre on nice days, such as today. Yep and the internal areas on not so nice days. And whether uh, that is human nature or not, that's what we're finding happens regularly. Uh, our kitchen has a capacity, certain capacity. Um, we would struggle to, to be able to cater for all seats at all times. We've never had to do that. Uh, we had some uh, in instances during COVID where we asked people or told people we couldn't serve them due to the numbers of restrictions, but we find it works well at parking. Um, yes. Further question? Yes, Mr Deputy Mayor. And so <coughs> how many parking spaces do you have? Is it... We many? have unlimited parking spaces, in my view. We have all of Stirling Street, all of Meadow Street. Um, we have unlimited parking. OK. Um, well, I'll... Um, I'll just, yeah, I'll leave that there. Thank you. Councillor Kiley. Thank you. <coughs> Mr Noonan, would you consider um, a condition being placed on this uh, approval in terms of uh, storage of fertiliser not being permitted um, within the property, given its proximity to, to nearby residences? Yeah. Well, the only fertiliser we store is a two kilogram container of, uh, of a non-odorous uh, fertiliser. That's stored in the bunkhouse, but we don't store fertilisers on the property. Uh, just that I've had reports that there was 
smells emanating from the property. So if it's not fertiliser, what, what could it be that we could... Well, I couldn't uh, answer that question. We don't store fertiliser. We did have um, a surprise visit, I must say, from an environmental health officer from the council quite recently who had been told that, she, uh, that there were uh, odours emanating. We did a detailed tour of the property. She quickly agreed that there were no uh, products on the property that would... Uh, that would cause that, uh, that issue. Now, what we do with people who request fertilisers, chemicals uh, or soils is we refer them to our neighbouring garden centre across the railway line who stocks ample amounts of that product. Our garden centre is not built, not designed, not intended to stock that type of stuff. So go to Bunnings, go to Mitre 10, sorry to cut go you to short. the garden, so uh, it wouldn't, the garden centre. It wouldn't be a bother then if that was a condition placed on the approval? Well, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd want to see the detail of that condition. As I said, we, we, we store... Well, if you're not storing them, then you wouldn't well, have a problem with it. Well, I've just explained to you, Councillor, we do store in a container a non-odorous uh, fertiliser. So if your condition wants to allow for that, uh, we'd give that thought. OK, we might consider that. Um, yep. The other thing is expansion of uh, operations or storage of materials onto the verge. Um, is, would that be something else you would uh, accept as a condition placed on the uh, approval? Well, uh, we don't store any material on the verge, never have. So again, you wouldn't have any problem with that condition either then? Well, I'd like to see the condition first. OK, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Uh, no more questions for you. Thank you, Mr Noonan. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Uh, you'll note, uh, councillors, there's two written deputations, from one from Stephanie Raddus and one from Mr Jeff Hunt. Please make sure you read those. And questions to staff on this issue. Councillor Henderson first. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Coton. Um, with the, uh, the review of the, uh, the parking for Guildford, would uh, staff uh, consider a loading zone on Sterling Street adjacent to the property? Um, I think the, the parking um, for along Sterling Street has previously been considered by council. That's been to council previously, I think, um, and a number of times in council has made decision in relation to that matter. So, uh, but I don't think there's a loading bay per se there. Uh, so, would that be considered in the study or the review? It's the study is uh, looking at certain areas, and I'll have to take it on notice. But I'm pretty sure that Sterling Street's not included in the the areas that's out for consultation at the moment. Councillor Johnson, do you have a question? A question uh, for Mr Russell. Is this a retrospective application? Hi, through Mr Deputy Mayor, I think we've got to remember first and foremost, this is a scheme amendment proposal as opposed to a development application. Um, it is quite obvious, and no one's hiding this fact, that the garden centre is there, as we well know. So to the extent, you, if, you, if, you want, if you want to say that you have a scheme amendment proposing uh, a, uh, to facilitate a use that's already there, and that might make it a retrospective scheme amendment, then yes, I'm happy to say that, that that's what you could call this. Although in the common term that schemes talk about retrospective applications, this is not one of those. Further question, Councillor Johnson? Councillor Henderson? Um, it's probably a logistics thing. Um, there's a, a legacy five-minute parking zone on Meadow Street adjacent to the post office, or the old post office. Is that ever going to be changed? You got any comment, Mr Coton, or is that a decision of council? I'm pretty sure that's been to council not that long ago as well um, in, in relation to the... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to go back and check the history of it, but I'm fairly sure that decision has come to council not that long ago. As well. The point is it's still showing us five minutes. Thank you. Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Through you to the staff. Um, I'd just like to know, um, with the parking along Stirling Street, um, so there's 35... They're catering for about 35 um, patrons, Mr Noonan said. Um, how many parking bays would they require for that? Mm -hmm. Through Mr Deputy Mayor, restaurants have a parking rate under our scheme of one bay for every four persons. The building is designed to accommodate. Okay. And 
Am I correct in that poster has, is it four out the front on Stirling Street, four bays? Can I answer that, Deputy Mayor? Deputy Mayor? Uh, I, I, I'm happy for you to do it, Mr Russell. Uh, if you haven't got that information, I'm happy to take it from Mr Noonan. Uh, four or five, Mr Mayor. I was only out there yesterday. I didn't stop to count. The, I, I could have checked on the approval. Four to five bays from recollection. If you can just confirm... It, I've put my glasses on uh, Six. Uh, Seven days. Seven. Seven. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? Um, yes, yes, thank you. Um, Mr Ross, I'd just like to ask, so then for the garden centre, what is the amount of parking that would be required and how do we work around that? Uh, through you, Mr Deputy Mayor, I think um, it's important to note that if this amendment goes through, and it's a big if because one, the council's got to initiate it, and B, ultimately the minister's got to agree to it. But what that will then mean subsequently is Mr Nerner would have to make a development application, which would be retrospective, for the garden centre. But I would add there that when the council considered the restaurant application, Three pages, in fact, the bulk of the assessment of the application addressed the matter of parking. And we talked about the scheme parking requirements for an office, for a garden centre and for the restaurant. And we identified that and then we did, if you recall, staff did a week-long survey, morning and afternoon of the premises already operating with all of those three things to look at actual demand. And all of that was in the report. And when we arrived on the condition to say that the Mr Murden should uh, make a contribution or construct at his cost public bays in Stirling Street, the number that we arrived at was the number that the council were, uh, supported for the totality of the development. Um, because we understood the parking. So the seven bays, so the question around what the scheme requirements are in total was in that report. It's certainly a shortfall, as that report noted. The council's already adjudicated in the uh, considering the restaurant what would also be the parking demand associated with the garden centre around that. But council is free to revisit that in further detail if it ever has before it an application by Mr Noonan for the garden centre. And I say if because yourselves have to decide to initiate it and then even if you do, the minister has to be satisfied to present it, Mr Mayor. Any further questions, councillors? Councillor Kiley. Uh, to staff, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, thank you. <coughs> I'm interested in the definition of garden centre. Does that require a certain percentage of plants to be for sale? Um, I'm just, I mean, I personally like the garden centre feel that it has, but I would be concerned that if it became a um, retail area for a whole range of other products as opposed to pl plants and the like. So is there a definition that would determine that? Mr Russell? Uh, through Mr Mayor, um, the garden centre definition in our scheme doesn't say, doesn't specify a percentage or an amount of plants that you need to sell, but like everything else in statutory planning, and it is based on fact and degree, uh, and we'd look at that if Mr Noonan was to have uh, maybe three agapanthers for sale and um, 200 square metres of other stuff, clothes, uh, trinkets, the like, then common sense, applying fact and degree, would hardly find that that's a garden centre. But you've got to take it on the facts and degrees of the circumstances in front of you. We have no such definition to say you've got to sell 20% plants, 30% plants, or the like of that, no. Uh, so just to follow up, would it be possible to include a condition um, to, to specify some sort of control over the fact that it would be maintained as a garden centre, as a normal person might view what a garden centre was? Very quickly through Mr Deputy Mayor, it's open to this council and considering this amendment to contemplate any conditions it want, would want to attach to the additional use of garden centre that would need to be imposed as conditions of approval if you got to the point of granting approval. It's open to the council, of course, to do that uh, if it wishes to initiate this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Richardson. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just wondering if I can ask a question through you to uh, Mr Noonan, if possible. Just sort of clarify those eight car parking spaces that seven. would be, or oh, seven, sorry, required car parking spaces. But does that include uh, staff and how many staff would be working on the property, uh, as well as parking, obviously, for Mr Noonan and his wife? Um, if you could just... Uh, I'll allow the question because we need this information. Mr thank Noonan, you. if you come back to the podium, thank you. Mr Deputy Mayor, I'd just like to understand the question a little more clearly, if I may. <clears throat> Thank you. So we've talked about the seven uh, customer car parking car, mm -hmm. car spaces currently, and I'm just wondering, can we clarify exactly where they are? So at the front of the post office, where the original car parking is, there's three, there's bays. three there. Yep. And, then uh, you have and the... they're all limited at the moment to a five-minute zone, which we've discussed tonight. So okay. they tend to be rarely used by, by customers because they're all concerned they're going to get a ticket if they stay sure. there for longer than five. Yeah. And then you've got the driveway to the mechanics hall. And no, then... no, no, we don't Sorry. use that. No, no, but I'm just saying the driveway is there and yes, then you've yes. got the further three or There's is only three. Four? There's three bays on, on Meadow Street. After the driveway to the mechanics hall That's is right. another... There are only three. Another uh, three after in, that. In front of our building, there are yes. three bays. And then you've got the driveway to the mechanics hall. To the north, yes. Yes, and yep. then you've got another three there or no, four? No, well, well, from there there's an area of green, lawn, no parking. No, hidden. no, there's three from the, the jail car parking. So you've got the mechanics hall driveway where you've got access to go in yep, and out. Yep. And then there's another three or four going back towards the jail. Uh, there's an area of, of Green Verge with no parking directly in front of the Mechanics Institute. Then mm -hmm. it goes to parking, which stretches back up to, to uh, the, where the... Um, Is that included in your no, seven? No, Or are you just saying the three are out the front of the yeah, post three office? three out the front, and then, and the then we, we, by agreement, um, mm -hmm. after mediation that sat in our last matter, constructed four bays at our cost yes. on Stirling Street. Stirling Street. Yep. And, that, and then... Uh, just, so, sorry, that was the full extent of the required bays at that time. Okay. And then where do you, how many staff would you have on on a normal day shift then? <clears throat> uh, there's four staff. Uh, at the moment they share car. Uh, they all, uh, we have um, uh, two cars that, uh, that our staff uh, would bring. There's two of them that share vehicles. They tend to park now that there's some form of logic in the parking on Stirling Street. Uh, on the southern side of Stirling Street, against the railway line, right. from the no parking, where, where the no parking stops, back to the east, mm -hmm. which is what I was referring to Councillor Scanlon's uh, comment earlier about the unlimited, in my view, parking south of Stirling Street. Right. You know, we have a long history of comments relating to parking in mm -hmm. front of our property, at the side of our property. It's a management problem. Yep. It's terrific to see that the no parking areas that have been designated on the corner of Meadow and Stirling are now working. What we'd like to see is formalisation of the parking. I just want to get back, Stirling, if I can, quickly back, back to those car back park to spaces. East. So we've talked about seven potentially at the stage you have, but mm -hmm. you're saying two car park staff, uh, two cars across the road for your staff, and then so th those four staff are your garden <coughs> staff or restaurant and cafe right. staff yep. combined total. Yep. So two in the garden, maybe two in the restaurant. No, one in the garden, three in the restaurant. Three in the restaurant yep. and one garden. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what about, um, say, perhaps yourself or your wife? Then where do you park? Uh, wherever we can. So we'll park on Meadow Street. Okay. Uh, we rarely park on our bays, but we park on the bays that we've designated the seven right. bays. But you know, my, my point is there is no problem with the quantity of car parking. I'm just looking it's at staff-wise what they take up during the day and yep. then what's left over for customers. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for thank you, uh, answering that question. Councillor Johnson, you had one last question for staff. Yeah, one last question for staff. Um, uh, through you, Mr Jepsy Mayor, to Mr Coulton. Uh, would it be possible to remove those five-minute parking signs from those two um, bays in Meadow Street? Because clearly I think Council's already voted to have those removed and it would open up to uh, two more parking bays in Guildford. Mr. Coton. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into the history of those signs. Uh, thank you, councillors. It's now eight minutes past eight in accordance with last month's resolution. We're now going to have a ten minute comfort break. So uh, sorry to the people who, in the gallery, but we're going to have an adjournment for uh, ten minutes and we'll then reconvene the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, councillors. We'll now resume the meeting. The next item uh, for deputation is item 4.7, State Administrative Tribunal Reconsideration, Proposed Civil Work Site Remediation, Clayton Street, Bellevue. 
It's on page 721 of the agenda. And I'd like to welcome to the podium Mr Mark Richards, President of the Bellevue Residents and Ratepayers Association. You have five minutes, thanks, Mr Richards, and I'll try and warn you when you've got a minute left. Thank you. Mr Deputy Mayor, Councillors and staff, having reviewed the agenda item for Lot 134, uh, 134 Clayton Street, um, the Bellevue Residents and Ratepayers Association supports the staff recommendations regarding the site's remediation, with one exception. We ask the Council includes that the remediation meets any standards or requirements for land zoned residential development in line with the Bellevue East Land Use Study, Bellis, as adopted by Council at the August 14, 2013 Council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Councillors? Councillor Kiley. I'm just interested in the difference between what it would be remediated at and what a, a residential remediation would entail um, from staff, if I could. Oh, so no questions for Mr Richards? Uh, uh, I could ask Mr Richards what the definition, uh, what, what would be his reasoning behind that request? Well, the, the whole premise with regards to the Bellevue East, East Land Use Study and the consultation and the public, con you know, this document took a lot, of, uh, a lot of time and a lot of effort to put together eight years ago. And the whole premise of this document was the conflict of um, zoning. If you look up Bellevue, we've got two of the worst environmental um, sites in a, recorded in Australia's history. The Omex site, and you also had the fires at Bilby Street as well. This document was put to try and stop the conflicts. At the present time, traffic's a real issue on Clayton Street. You've got industrial right in the heart of residential. Now, if this site goes through as a um, potential industrial site, I'm not sure how many factories you're going to, or how many industrial um, warehouses or factories you're going to be able to put into that site. But Clayton Street, with traffic, is an absolute nightmare as it is. You've got trucks coming out of Clayton Street in the residential area already that have got um, pilot vehicles, escort vehicles. Like, it's just getting worse and worse. And, th and as I said, this whole, the whole document was put together to try and stop the conflict with industrial encroaching upon uh, residential areas. So uh, if... And th that was the whole premise. So council, unfortunately, or, or the staff or whoever, eight years, you know, we should have had these re rezoning sorted out when it was a lot easier to do. Now it's a lot more difficult. And if this does go through as an uh, industrial uh, site... I'd say you're going to have 30 to 40 um, new units. You're going to have trucks coming and going, supplying materials to these um, potential factories. You're going to have each of the factories also having a truck or a trailer. And they're all going to be straight onto Clayton Street. Clayton Street's um, in trouble with the traffic already. And it's right in the heart of the residential um, area designated. It's a, if you ever study up the document, it's actually Precinct 8. And one of the, the major recommendations was to have all that area rezoned residential. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. No question of staff. Right. Any more questions, Mr Richards? Then I thank you for attending and we'll hear from you again shortly. Oh, yeah. Uh, Question, Councillor Johnson. Oh, OK. Councillor Coley, you go first. The question again was that uh, what's the difference between the commercial rehabilitation and residential rehabilitation? Perhaps just before you answer that, Mr Russell, is that part of the considerations we consider as part of this um, uh, reconsideration, or should we only be concentrating on the issues we refused it for, or can we add uh, something in your view? Three, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it goes to the heart of the standard of rehabilitation that's being proposed here. So, if 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 council wants to, I mean, the, the difference here, and I'll take the question I know in the first instance to find out what the standard differences are between re what what levels of necessary rehabilitation for an industrial use versus a residential use. 
Uh, but then, secondly, around all of that, I suppose, yes, if you've, what you're saying is you want a high standard of remediation, not in line with what would be the necessary requirement for industrial, but to a higher level, well, I can advise you of that, I suppose, the question might be around that whether or not you might get a situation as to you could impose it. It's, 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 it's within the remit of relevance, but you might find you might struggle to substantiate requiring them to me, me, remediate to a level beyond what the existing zoning provides for, if that makes sense, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. So my question really relates to the um, um, resolution regarding Ballas, which I think might have been at the last meeting or the meeting before. Um, I, th I think what council agreed in that meeting was at a later meeting to initiate a scheme amendment for this land. What's the proposed future zoning for this this land? To Mr. Russell, or possibly Mr. Vandalin, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that <clears throat> this land is proposed in the Ballas to to be changed to residential in the longer term. Um, in regards to the the previous council resolution. It, it identified specific scheme amendments for the city to progress with. In relation to this specific scheme amendment, the resolution identified that the city continue its discussions with the with the department because <coughs> because it, the, this land is currently um, zoned industrial under the both the MRS and under our scheme. Previous discussions with the commission has indicated that they wouldn't support in support of a change on the, uh, in, in the MRS to industrial, and that that is something that they will review as part of the sub-regional framework, and they, they're going to start that review later this year. So we'll continue that discussion through that, um, um, through, through that mechanism. That's, so right now it, it, we couldn't really substantiate remediation to a residential standard? No, because the zoning, the residential zoning, is not in place. So therefore, you, you, you know, as full as indicated, it's certainly at the moment still industrial. Yeah. And I'm guessing that the the owner could remediate it and then go ahead and apply for an industrial premise there, and um, build. They haven't indicated what the purpose for the remediation yeah. is and okay. what they're going to do thereafter. I've got, I've got more questions on a different, a different vein. Um, in the report, it says that there is an asbestos dust monitor, but it appears, despite the site being very large, there's only one asbestos dust monitor um, shown in the, uh, in the plan. Why is only one needed? Can any of the staff answer that question? Previous Deputy Mayor, take that on notice. And I was also going to ask how an, how an asbestos dust monitor can tell the difference between asbestos and ordinary dust, but I guess you'd have to take that on notice as well. That's why it's called an asbestos dust monitor. Well, uh, it's, it's all dust. Uh, the other question relates to, in the, um, there is a environmental plan which describes how the work is going to be done. Is that a new document as a result of this SAP um, consideration? Through Mr Deputy Mayor, yes, that was requested by us for so mediation to demonstrate how they're actually going to manage the site in terms of its impacts. Okay, so that's completely new. And the, the other part of the, um, the description of how it was going to be done suggests that at a certain distance down, there's going to be a raft built, so they're not going to actually dig all the way down and dig out all of the contaminated film. They're only going to go down a certain distance. Is that right? Uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, yes, it's all in the yeah. environmental management plan. Okay. And it describes something called a raft, which they will build at that level. What exactly do they mean by that? Do we know what that means? Because I couldn't see any details of how the raft would be constructed. Mr Russell? On notice, please, Mr Deputy Mayor. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Councillor Catalano. Uh, thank you. How long... Um, is this anticipated um, change from industrial, rezoning from industrial to residential, uh, likely to take? Mr. Vandalin. 
Mr. Deputy Mayor, it is it's really impossible to to give a time frame to it because it relies on on firstly the MRS amendment to, to be progressed and an MRS amendment cannot be progressed without the consent of, of the the commission. And they they have indicated that <coughs> such um, indications should start with an acknowledgement in the sub-regional frameworks. So if that happens in the next two years in that, uh, in, in that um, document, then only the process of, of, of the MRS amendment can start. So it could be quite a considerable time to do, and I then have to also identify that even if you get that land um, rezoned to, to <coughs> residential, <clears throat> there will be it will be a, 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 there will be a practical difficulty in implementing it because you'll have an incompatibility between the residential properties that that you now zone and are vacant and try to develop um, with the industrial development in place. So normally, such <coughs> change from industrial to to residential is only effective if all the landowners get together and redevelop the whole area at the same time. There's not a lot of examples where industrial developments redeveloped into residential in a staged approach, approach while there's still um, industrial um, development on Thank the you. site. <coughs> and further, further just questions? for this particular one, this particular um, lot that we're talking about tonight, um, I mean, what's the chance of that, um, you know, getting together with, I mean, you say all landowners, but I mean, are you talking about this particular landowner on their own or are they do you talking about this landowner with other landowners? Sorry, I just don't get how, oh, how extensive these all these landowners have to be because I'm trying to understand. Um, we've got Bellis. Uh, with these um, kind of expectations now out there in the community that there's going to be uh, this potential future rezoning, but how's that going to be practical? How's it going to actually happen? Mr Mayor, I think I've tried to answer that, that in the previous answer I've provided. Just in relation to the um, which properties are included, it will be those properties are that are currently zoned industrial, which will include the, the subject property of this application. Perhaps a further discussion with Mr. Van der Linde during the week may assist. Councillor Johnson. Just more questions on this environmental management plan. It says the removal of the entire landfill contents is not economically viable given the estimated volume of waste in excess of 100. Um, thousand cubic meters um, uh, that seems to suggest that if it was remediated to an industrial standard it would have to be remediated again to a residential standard uh, just wondering whether that's something that we ought to be bringing to the uh, attention of SAT for the decision making process Mr Russell that makes sense? Um, if, if there's if there's an intention if there's an intention to rezone this to residential land, but we're not going to remove the uh, entire volume of, uh, of, of this contaminated waste material, um, surely it's going to remain contaminated. And then if it was rezoned to residential, it would have to be decontaminated again by, by the, either the same owner or the new owner. So it makes you wonder whether it's worth doing it at all in the current time frame. Is that something we should bring to the attention of Sam? Uh, through you, Mr Deputy Mayor, with respect, I think the SAT would say this very simply to anyone that put that proposition to it. That is a speculative consideration, not reflective of the Metropolitan Region Scheme zoning nor the local planning scheme zoning. So it would say no. The rehabilitation being sought is ostensibly for the industrial development of the property or development that is capable of being approved in the industrial zoning. It is not to a standard, nor need it be, to develop it for a speculative purpose of a future potential rezoning for residential. 
that would be what the set would say, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I think, undoubtedly. <coughs> Thank you. Um, we'll now move to the next item, item 4.8. Uh, Council recommendation of the State Development Assessment Unit significant development application stock feed grain mill in uh, Gaston Road, Bullsbrook. It's on page 787. And Mr. Craig Howlett, President of the Bullsbrook Residents and Ratepayers Association. Mr. Howlett, you have five minutes. Oh, sorry, Mr. Hollett, and you'll give you a warning at four. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, can I say at the outset that the Bullsbrook Residents and Ratepayers Association supports the recommendation that has been made to Council uh, that the Council inform the SDAU this application is not supported. You'll be aware that BRA, as we are referred to in Bullsbrook, objected to the original DA uh, for a smaller scale grain plant at the same site uh, and will lodge an objection to the current application. Um, councillors are urged to review the objections that were contained within the JDAP agenda, uh, which looked at this and refused the application for the 17th of August 2020, especially the objections raised by various adjoining landowners um, who raised a number of objections. There's a number of points that, in, a, in addition to the council's, uh, council officer's recommendations, that just needs to be identified and which I'd like council just to be aware of as it considers this matter. Firstly, dealing with the economic benefits. The economic benefit analysis that's attached uh, in the papers refers to an additional 19 staff being employed on top of the existing 24 staff in the plant that's currently located in Upper Swan that will be re relocated. Now, the suggestion is this will create local employment opportunities in Bullsbrook. With respect, we have a highly mobile workforce in this day and age where people will travel large distances to go to and from work. I myself travel from Bullsbrook to West Perth every day. So, you know, 50 kilometres is a pretty large pool and definitely outside the city of Swan. So I think council needs to be aware of that issue and to be cognizant of that point. The other thing in relation to the economic benefits submission that is made is that it refers to an existing 24 staff plus 19 staff. Now, my math tells me that's 33 people. Um, but when you actually look at the, all of the other documents, they all refer to a maximum of 26 staff being employed at this facility. So somewhere the figures are skewed. Um, I don't know where the additional numbers have come into play in this equation, but Council should just be cognizant of that. Now, one of the main issues arising out of this uh, application uh, is traffic issues. We're talking about RAV4 vehicles coming into uh, the area. For those of you who know where Morley Road and Gaston Road come off uh, Mushay South Road, um, you'll probably also be aware of the intersection of Neves Road and Mushay South and Railway Roads uh, where the trucks will be coming from the highway. Now, anyone who has a look at that intersection will know, and this is the intersection of Neves and Mushay South, will know that there is a right turning lane for cars turning into Neves Road coming from Rutland. So they're coming from the north direction heading south to Neves and turning right. That lane is where the normal centre of the road is and where the turning lane has been put in, the road, a bow has been put in so the cars actually go around that turning lane. Now you've got these RAV4 vehicles which are up to 27 and a half metres in length coming off that road, trying to turn in a single lane. Sorry, it's not going to happen. They're going to pull into that uh, turning lane and that road, that corner, that turning lane is incredibly busy, especially since the opening of Tonkin Highway because people use that to get from Bullsbrook to the Tonkin Highway. Okay, We'd love to use Stock Road, but the council hasn't built that yet, so we can't. So we have to use that road. Um, the same for people coming to access Mushay. The exit for Mushay is at Neves Road. How do they then get to Mushay? They go up Mushay South Road. There is no other way for them to get there unless they go all the way across. You have the one road minute left. Thank you. Thank you. So there are issues there with traffic. There's issues with sighting that is identified in the report. There are issues which were identified in the previous complaints 
Uh, sorry, previous objections about heavy fog in that area. Morley Road is a 110 kilometre an hour zone. It's on a bend on Mushay South Road. It's dangerous. There are school buses that use that road on a daily basis to bring children to and from the Ballsbrook area. There's a catchment area there. Um, so, all in all, we've got a large traffic problem. Environmentally, there are issues with the disposal of stormwater. There's issues with rodent control that aren't addressed in these reports. The, the stormwater is addressed, but what it does, it puts all the stormwater into the ground, which goes into the Ellenbrook catchment. What's going to happen with any pollutants that are brought in? They're going to get put into that system and they're going to further pollute it. Thank Last you, Mr point. Hollett. That's your five minutes. Thank you. I've said right from the get-go and all deputies, it's a strict five minutes because of the number of deputations. If you have any questions of Mr Hollett, you can follow up during the week. Thank you, Mr Thank Hollett. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. You can ask a question, but I don't want it to be turning into another deputation. Thanks, uh, Councillor Kiley, because we've still got several more deputations. Thank you. Just a question then. Uh, thank you for coming in and making this important um, presentation. Are you familiar with the, uh, uh, I think it's the Supreme Court decision on the, um, the zoning, relate, uh, its applicability? The Harvest to a, and Midwest JDAP decision? That's the one. Yes, I Thank am you. With that. Can you just explain a little bit for those who might not be so familiar with the implications of that? Because that really hasn't been discussed at Council before. Okay. The, the I'll, I'll allow two minutes, Mr Hollett, and then I'm going to draw it there, yes, I think. Yes. Certainly. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. The application tries to negate that decision by suggesting that the WAPC does not have to have regard to it on the basis, and it refers to it as a legislative instrument, which it's not. Greg, could you just explain what the decision was for the benefit of...? The, the decision was that um, it wasn't an appropriate use of land that was, had the same zoning as this land, but it was up the road in Shire of Chittering, but it wasn't appropriate to build a, a similar if not identical type of plant uh, processing grain for feed, uh, that it wasn't an appropriate use of the land. And that was what pulled this one up as well. So, and that, that decision has to be taken into account by, uh, under the section 275 subsection 6 of the Planning and Development Act because of the factors that are set out in that section that have to be taken into account. So it can't just be disregarded as has been suggested by the applicant. Um, I hope that answers your question, Councillor. I don't wish to take Thank you very time. much. Any other questions, Councillors? Then I thank you for your attention. Any questions of staff, Councillors? Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. No questions of... Mayor, if I, uh, Deputy Councilor Mayor, if Pilot. I could. So, um, Mr Russell, Mr Vanderlyn, the, um, the decision that was spoken about just then, um, just to sum that up, am I incorrect in saying that the zoning of the land um, would not support an industrial or, uh, as you've got here, use class industry general on rural land? Is that what the basic uh, summation of that court decision would be? Uh, through Mr Deputy Mayor, in short, yes, the significance of um, the harvest, the um, regional JDAP, whatever it was called, that made the decision was that it made a decision with respect to uh, a what we say directly comparable facility to this to the one in question here uh, on a um, similar zoning to the one that we have here under our scheme. And that Supreme Court decision found that the facility was not an industry rural facility under the Shire Chittering Scheme, which is the same definition as we have in our scheme. So a like facility with the same operable definition in the scheme said it's not a rural industry. And in not being a rural industry, then it's either a general industry or an industry light, either of which can't be approved in the zone. But as this report will state, and as uh, Mr Hollitz has uh, alluded to, uh, the legislative instrument allows the Commission as the decision maker 
to make a decision other than in accordance with a piece of legislation or other legislation in this instance being our local planning scheme. So even though our local planning scheme, if we were making this decision, we simply could not approve it because the law, the instrument doesn't allow it. These new provisions in the Planning Development Act allow the Commission and its State Development Assessment Unit to approve something where we could not. One follow-up. Yes. Um, would it be appropriate to include another point in the recommendation to suggest that um, given we have a DCP in place for South, uh, South uh, Bullsbrook uh, industrial area, that that would be the most appropriate and orderly planning uh, place to locate such an industrial, uh, rural industrial type activity, um, given that we have DCPs and we are reliant on that, those DCPs to develop the broader area for, for a range of industries. So would that, could that be a, an improvement to the recommendation? Uh, three, Mr Deputy Mayor, that's up to the Council to decide. The Council can see fit to add anything in its rec a recommendation or resolution to recommend to the Commission on this application, Is it, and the Commission may or may not or have due regard to it, but whether or not it sees any other ma uh, uh, matter as relevant, it's up to it. Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Um, to do with transport, um, should the SAT uh, approve this, um, in regard to the speed limits and the uh, physical access for a RAV4 vehicle, um, would the process to deal with that happen in parallel with um, the application or after it all got going? And would we have an extended period where it's uh, perhaps not really a, a safe environment? Through Mr Deputy, I think first and foremost it's, it's not the SAT that's dealing with this application, it's the State Development Assessment Unit. Yeah. Um, the State Development Assessment Unit, um, I mean obviously as of right vehicles can service this facility. As I understand it, if you want to have vehicles that are restricted access vehicles beyond as of right vehicles, then you need to get the uh, consent of main roads for any part of the road network to be designated for that purpose. So that is a process that sits, you might say, conjoined with uh, the, the need for a development application to have such servicing, but it sits outside of it. So the SAT or the, the State Development Assessment Unit, to my understanding, couldn't go beyond its jurisdiction to make a decision on behalf of another agency that uh, um, that that um, that it doesn't have a remit for the very and this is a very interesting legal proposition and I don't I, I, I don't want to confuse the matter but the instrument these special powers that are written in by the government in relation to the economic or the recovery for COVID effectively says that any other, any other party that is operating under some other law. OK, um, uh, the planning minister here, if I understand it correctly, can require, confer with that other party to consider whether or not that other law has to give way to this application. So that's very significant. But in the ordinary course, under the normal parameters of the system, the approval of vehicles beyond as a right that would sit with another authority under another act wouldn't be touched on by the planning application under this new system that I have to say I'm not that familiar with or haven't seen it in practice. It's relatively new. Um, it's unclear as to whether or not these powers can allow the decision maker here to get around and over the top of other laws which might include laws governing what vehicles you can have on what road. So follow up if I may. So Potentially, the rate powers could be saddled with having to do some uh, works on the road to allow the RAV for um, use. Um, and uh, as for the speed limits, so that may happen after a, a development procedure. Is, is that where we're at? Mr Deputy Mayor, look, I would, I would hope that in the assessment of the application, if it required any upgrades to any part of the surrounding road network for this development to function, 
then it would certainly the, the tests of need, nexus and reasonableness that relate to the imposition of development conditions, development approval conditions would arise and a decision maker, if it's mindful to permit this, would then look at whether or not there is a need in connection with this development to impose conditions that might have the development do the road upgrading. But that will be a question for the State Development Assessment Unit, the parties assessing it, the Commission, who will determine it to work out. Thank you. Uh, that completes that item. We're going to the next item, it's item 5.1, construction of footpaths, Sophia Street, Bellevue, and I welcome back to the podium Mr Mark Richards. It's on page 859. Thank you, Councillors. You have five minutes. Mr Deputy Mayor, Councillors and staff, the Bellevue Residents and Ratepayers Association, BRA, and not to be confused with um, Bullsbrook uh, Residents and Ratepayers, uh, BRA Association, request the deferral of a decision on Sophia Street footpath until after the meeting between BRA and the city staff concerning Ballas on the 23rd of June. We, we request the deferral as a clar clarification, as clarification is needed as to where a footpath can provide the best access from Albert Street to the re relevant playground in Bellevue. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? Of staff. Thank you, Mr. Um, Richards, for your deputation. Thank You're you. Free to leave if you wish. Councillor Johnson, you have a question of staff. Um, I went along to uh, Sophia Street uh, at the weekend to take a look, and uh, I noted that uh, the uh, I noted that if, if one were to imagine that one was a, a parent pushing a pram, and you're coming down Albert Street and then down Sophia Street, what would stop you getting onto Railway Reserve to get down to the Railway Reserve um, Children's Playground? Would be the drain between Sophia Street and the railway reserve. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether, did this design include a culvert of some sort? Up through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. 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 Cohen? No, it didn't. The, the design is as shown on page 862. Okay. So, and it was an outcome of the Bella study. Yeah. So staff did the consultation with those adjoining properties and um, there were objections yeah. to it. So yeah, that was the... Yeah, so one of them says it's a, a road from nowhere to nowhere. But the real question is, it seems to me that it is reasonable to to assume that sort of parents might walk down Albert Street, because um, there is quite a large catchment, it's down a hill, down Sophia Street, or possibly down May Street, and then across. So would it be a reasonable thing, instead of building this path, to build a culvert so that somebody pushing a pram down Sophia Street could get straight onto the railway reserve? Would that be a better use of the, of the funding? Quite possibly. Maybe all those things can be considered in the deferral time. OK, uh, moving on to the next item. It's item 6.7, policy debt collection rates and service charges, page 969. have three uh, speakers, I believe, and the first one I'll invite uh, Major Nava Brooks from the Salvation Army Swan View Corps to the podium. Thank you, Major Brooks. You have five minutes and I'll give you a warning at four. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to support Councillor Prenovic's motion to defer item 6.7. So Council can do more work on a proposed policy which deals with debt collection, rates and service charges and the eventual sale of homes when rates are in arrears for three years or more. As a representative of the Salvation Army working in the City of Swan, we meet with vulnerable community members on a daily basis. Whilst acknowledging that there have been a minimal number of people affected by this policy as it stands, we believe the existence of this policy in its current form can adversely impact vulnerable members of this community. Every Friday night, it's, sorry, every Friday, the Salvation Army provides rescued food to Clayton View Primary School, a school that has a large population of struggling families. Every Tuesday, we distribute rescued food to approximately 50 to 60 families at our market day. Every Thursday, we see approximately 40 families accessing our cafe, which provides free beverages and meals to the community. The people accessing these services are not just homeless. We are seeing an increase of people who we call the working poor, 
who have joined our queues for food, along with the unemployed and those affected by family violence, mental health concerns and disabilities. Centrelink payments and low incomes do not stretch far enough to manage large bills such as rates, and we endorse and support community collaboration that seeks to identify, assess and support these vulnerable families. Forcing the sale of properties does not remove the problem. In actual fact, people faced with having their homes sold don't always move away because of their connection to country, place and community. The forced sale of homes leads to homelessness within the city and it increases the likelihood of civil and criminal offences. We are encouraged by the City of Swan's engagement in sponsoring a homelessness forum and its well-respected progress on their community strategic action plan. But this particular policy in its current form can be seen as a setback to strategic community engagement that supports the vulnerable. Homelessness is about people. People experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. In adopting a punitive approach, Council risks removing the at-risk component by taking actions that will impose a lived experience of homelessness on these families impacted by the forced sale of their homes. The City of Swan's strategic community plan specifically references the Council's commitment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. How does the Council propose to implement the current rates arrears strategy whilst maintaining the commitment to sustainable community goals, which include, as referenced on page 12 of the strategic plan, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being? These competing positions create a clear cognitive dissonance. The Salvation Army in Swan View is currently working with the Department of Education and local job placement providers to provide high level of support for young people who have been identified as at risk of disengagement from education and employment due to their family situations. Forcing the sale of homes will only reinforce the stress on these families and solidify their intergenerational poverty cycle that families in the City of Swan are experiencing. The Salvation Army endorses a review of this policy to help empower families and build healthy community rather than to create further barriers that will only serve to increase homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Councillors? Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Yeah, um, I, I guess just I ought to begin by just mentioning this is not an existing policy, it's a proposed new policy uh, as a result of the previous council resolution. So it's something brand new and it's based upon uh, the Local Government Act and existing uh, approaches I believe staff took. So the question we've got is how would you change it? Co-design is a really significant uh, way of uh, inclusive participation in working out strategies such as these that's recognised across multiple sectors. The Salvation Army is very happy to engage in consultation on strategy or, and on improving this policy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Perry. Mr Mayor, am I allowed to inform the can other people that are watching live stream how many houses we've sold in the last 20 years in regards to a question or not? Well, Mr. you can ask a question of staff once uh, questions of the um, um, major have been dealt with. So I'll put a very quick question. Um, so in regards to the... So you're not against... So I understand the vulnerability side of the fence. So let's say it's other situations like businesses haven't paid their bills, um, all those other items that are not considered vulnerable mortgagee sales and everything else like that, you completely agree with the current situation that's our debt um, policy or debt payment policy? We agree that further improvement needs to be looked at, particularly to support the vulnerable in the community. And recognising that there has only been a minimal uh, impact regarding to this debt arrears policy, uh, the concern is that the opportunity is there 
for it to be enacted and we just want to make sure that it's right to support the vulnerable. Any other questions? Councillor Sk uh, Richardson. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. In terms of the, the area that you're working in, Swan View, um, have you had anyone who has struggled to pay their council rates uh, to the City of Swan who was on that list or has been on that list? We are aware of people who have, mm -hmm. are struggling with their rates, okay. specific to uh, being forced to sell their homes. We're not privy to that information. Is there a particular age group that might struggle more so than one? The um, demographic of people who mm. are seeking support are uh, varied, uh, but we see a large proportion of uh, single parent families uh, and people on low incomes, particularly in recent COVID environment, okay. where people have lost their hours and, and are on casual rates. Would you be looking at, with the review of this policy and the changes that it makes, would you be looking at working closely with perhaps staff in terms of negotiating for those that are vulnerable versus maybe we're talking about the mortgagee sales or different combinations, is that...? We would certainly be happy to engage in consultation if invited. Okay, thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr Deputy Mayor. So I think what you're saying is that we ought to modify, we could consider modifying this policy to include a statement about how do we deal with vulnerable people, be some definition of a vulnerable person and then there'll be some slightly different course taken. Is that the idea? That would be something determined in consultation, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do you have a uh, question of staff, Councillor Parry? Well, I, I know that. Uh, well, uh, in the interest of time, uh, Councillor Podovnik has motioned that she wants a deferral on this item. Now we can listen to another two deputations, which will take up another 10 minutes, and we have another round of questions, which will take up an unknown amount of time. But if there's no objection, and I know we can't make a decision tonight, on deferring this item and then to bring it back to a briefing, as per Councillor Podovnik's uh, 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 intention, is there any need to have the further two deputations now? I think so. Uh, well, I'm just asking, councillors, it's your meeting. I'll call on the next um, speaker, which is Mr Warren Palmer, who's speaking for Reverend Stuart Fenner from the Anglican Parish of Midland. He'll read his deputation. Thank you. Good evening, Deputy Mayor and councillors and staff. Um, this is uh, on behalf of Reverend uh, Stuart Fenner. Uh, I wish to express uh, my opposition to item 6.7 on the agenda of the council meeting of the 2nd of June. As someone who works in the Midland, uh, in Midland, providing support services for those experiencing homelessness and food insecurities, I believe the Council's approach to selling homes of those who are in long-term rates arrears is discriminatory and out of touch with community standards. While I appreciate that there are instances where the sale of someone's home is only appropriate action for Council to take, it must be clear that this is an absolute last resort. The Council has a moral obligation to ensure that anyone in rates arrears is fully and consistently notified uh, of Council's intentions uh, to recover the debt and to proactively engage with those in rent arrears as early as possible. The Council's debt uh, collection policy should include processes to identify the vulnerable, including those affected by divorce, terminal illness, uh, domestic violence, long-term unemployment and disability. It is of no one's best interest for homeowners to be forced out of their home due to rental, uh, into rental accommodation or homelessness if it can be avoided. The approach of both state and federal governments through this pandemic has demonstrated the merits of supporting the vulnerable job seeker, job keeper, rental and eviction moratoriums and other initiatives have helped our economy make an unexpected recovery and preserve living standards for community cohesion. As a result of this pandemic, the community now expects government authorities to address the needs of the vulnerable in a way that is compassionate, supportive and evidence-based. It is essential that the City of Swan's policy on debt collection is researched and provides flexibility and options to, those, uh, to support those in rent arrears to stay in their homes if at all possible. 
The time for such policies to be based on punitive and ideological assumptions is well and truly over, and the City of Swan cannot afford to be perceived in acting in this way. Once again, uh, sorry, once you have seen the supporting, uh, that supporting the vulnerable benefits everyone, you cannot unsee it. The community has seen this. The question is, has the City of Swan? That's from the Reverend. Thank you very much. Any questions, councillors? No questions. Thank you very much. And the final speaker on this item is Reverend Alison Gilchrist. Once again, you'll have five minutes, and I'll try and give you a warning at the four-minute mark. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm a bit sad that I'm the very last speaker of the day. I'll try and go as quickly as possible. <laughs> I, too, think we should have more time to dis decide uh, the uh, parameters of uh, how we uh, apply the policies, particularly to those who are most vulnerable. Anyone given a certain combination of circumstances can find themselves in a situation of vulnerability, including each one of us here. And the past 15 or 16 months has highlighted that to us in the realest way possible. We are all poten potentially just one pandemic, one genocide, one bad diagnosis, one divorce, one military coup, one retrenchment away from finding ourselves in a situation of vulnerability. Situations of vulnerability are never the choice of the person who is vulnerable. Whether that vulnerability has arisen suddenly, is the result of long-term life circumstances, such as a disability, or due to disadvantage in its many, many forms. To every individual, we owe a duty of care as fellow travellers on the road of life. My work in the city of Swan and my life here bring me into contact with many people who face the challenges of financial hardship, increasingly so in recent times. Those are the people who until recently were our neighbours, yours and mine. They now live in cars, sofa surf or camp out on church doorsteps. All this in a city which claims itself as a sustainable, thriving city of diverse people and places enjoying a great quality of life, health and well-being. For some of us, yes. For all of us, not. We are not the first city to face these issues, and as a result, there is a substantial amount of research which demonstrates a fair and reasonable and flexible approach with people in vulnerability leads to better payment outcomes and fewer resources expended in, in collection. Research found that organisations that made it easier for customers to consumers, customers, clients to obtain financial advice early in the piece saw much greater outcomes. The Money Advice Trust research amongst users on the national debt line, found that 87, 84%, sorry, 84 of clients re reported it less likely to be in a similar position once they'd had an intervention. And 92% of clients who set up different arrangements in, systems of, in, in situations of vulnerability carried on with their payments to their creditors. Frontline staff reported that when they were able to take people's mental health situations into full account, they were much more likely to recover a debt. Citizens Advice report that people who are in debt benefit from good practice. Those in arrears are more likely to engage, stay engaged, and make sustainable, sustainable repayments in less time, and resourcing is not wed, wasted on chasing payments. The Macmillan Cancer Support uh, Organisation states that providing early help to people diagnosed with cancer, for example, who anticipate they may well be in financial difficulty because of having to pay for treatment, may reduce their exposure to debt and the knock-on effect in their family and friends of getting early intervention in a place of vulnerability puts the organisations involved in that kind of work in good regard. Research in the credit sector has demonstrated the beneficial effects of early and constructive intervention. Many people welcomed the proactive early intervention approach and went on to receive help rescheduling their debts. Citizens' Advice recommends that identifying people who may be facing financial difficulty by monitoring is an invaluable action. Using a credit card to pay for essentials such as council tax is one particular easily identifiable difficulty. Missed or failed repayments is also a trigger where early intervention should be enacted. There are better ways, and I commend to you something that's on hand to us, a resource provided by the Ombudsman of Western Australia called the Local Government Collection of Overdue Rates for People in Vulnerable Situations, the Good Practice Guide. I believe that and good consultation will help us to have better outcomes for those in vulnerable situations. You have in one our city. minute left, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, questions. councillors? 
No thank questions. You. Thank you for your deputation. Uh, no questions of staff. Councillor Henderson first. Uh, thank you. In regard to the, the policy, uh, and obviously if we're going to defer this, it'll, we can work on it. Um, the letter of demand uh, concerns me a little. The, the 10 days, given that Australia Post is very irregular these days and in fact can take sometimes considerably longer than even five days, um, sh can we consider that as part of a review, please? If it gets deferred and gets reviewed, yes. Councillor um, Parry. Mr Mayor, are we able, am I able to ask uh, Ms Leahy? Um, you can regards... ask the question. I invited you to do it like, uh, 10 minutes ago. But... OK, well, that's fine. Um, if we can notify or can staff please advise how many houses have been sold in the past 20 years because of this process or Ms. previous Lay? process? Two, Mr Deputy Mayor. And how long, and the second question, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, if you don't mind, um, how long from the um, final notice and demand to the no payment in full has been received? What's the average time in regards to that, Ms. Leahy? Sorry, can you repeat so that? So, when please? you provide the final notice and demand notice, and to the basically till time we consider to turn, or that we propose to sell the house in regards to confidential items, how much is the average process? The timeline. The timeline. Uh, Mr Deputy Mayor, in accordance with the Act, it has to be at least three years. Thank you. Thank you. Question, Councillor Catalano. Thank you. Um, so um, why only so few um, properties sold over that time? Because people end up paying their rates. No, but... Um, you know, people, uh, the, for, the property seizure and sale, I imagine, goes through, through the magistrate's court. And then what happens? I mean, surely that's, that's where you go down and... Is it put a caveat at Landgate or is it that you actually go and instruct the, someone to sell the property or what, what actually happens? I mean... Pardon? I'll oh, let... I'll ask Ms Lay well, to answer the I'm question. I'm all new to this. I haven't heard actually how the whole process works, in Thank fact. Thank you. Ms Lay, did you understand the question? I believe so. Um, Mr Deputy Mayor, there are steps that we take every year to try to recover the debt. And once it re reaches a point of no payment made by three years as a minimum, we then present that this report to Council. Once we have the Council decision, it triggers the sale process and over the last 20 years only two have progressed to sale because the owners then pay. Councillor Johnson, you're first. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Deputy Mayor. My question also was, I think has been answered, but the question was, given what we see in the red folder um, from time to time, um, I think the question was, how can we see so few sales? But I think the answer basically was, once they get the uh, unpleasant letter, that people pay up. And I'll just caution, if you're going to refer to stuff in the red folder, which is confidential, they haven't asked a question yet. But uh, if you can answer Miss Lay, that'll be fantastic. Thank you. Councillor Johnson is correct. I have a further question Follow that I up. think we'll talk about. Uh, in general terms, some things that are in the red folder. So I uh, probably would need to just let you know I've got a confidential question about the same thing. Well, we we're going behind later. closed doors as soon as we finish this item. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'm interested from our esteemed guests whether they might be able to comment on this. Do, is there a particular organisation that after, say, 18 months of arrears, you think we might be able to notify them as part of our uh, notification? Is there... A, organisation or a government department that we should be notifying in, in line with their, their arrears notices going out? I, I don't know. <laughs> Miss Lay, did you understand the question? I don't know I whether th any of the... I think I do, but this is confidential information in relation to owners and we are not allowed to disclose that information. 
Thank you. Uh, I mean, look, I got the impression from the deputations we must be selling a dozen houses a year uh, with all the, the homelessness going on. And uh, I was aware that there was only two houses in the last 20 years. And I know of one, and I think it may apply to the other, it was part of a deceased estate where we couldn't track down any family relatives and it ended up going through probate through the... Uh, I forget the name of the, the section in Perth, but it was either through the Supreme Court because we just couldn't track down anyone of that family person who had deceased um, to get the rates back. And I, I think that might apply for, for both. So it's not the case where the City of Swan is out selling residence uh, houses underneath them. The program we have, usually in uh, every case other than two in the last 20 years, has resulted in the rates being paid eventually. Councillor Richardson, did you have a question? Quickly through you two staff, just what are the last two dates of those particular properties, if, if they can remember? Thanks. Do you need to take it on notice? or 2019. For one or both? Both. Councillor Scanlon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Mayor. Through you, I'd just like to ask um, Mr Bishop um, if he could comment on the, um, the, the stress that it could cause um, a person who is vulnerable to um, have a notice of um, proceedings of sale of their home come through. So not the actual sale of the property, but the threat of it, how that could impact somebody. I think Mr Bishop could only offer an opinion, and I don't really think it goes to the, uh, the, the text or the issue of the policy itself. And if it's going to be deferred, you may ask those questions in a briefing style uh, situation. I don't think it's an appropriate question. Councillor Johnson, you had a, another question? Yeah, thanks, sir. Yeah, my, my question really goes to the uh, how rare is this event um, that uh, we sell somebody's house. So uh, the question, you know, how many in the last 20 years has been asked um, at least two or three times recently and mostly behind closed doors. This is the first time it's been asked in a public forum. Um, my question, I'm not trying to kind of um, outbid anybody here, and it's a serious subject. What about in the last 50? Could we take that on notice just so we can get a bit of a broader... Um, if we have records going back that far, but I think yeah. the staff would struggle, and I don't think it's relevant in the last 50. We've, we've got to deal with the current and the now. So... Um, just as relevant as 20. The last 20, I think, is uh, a good go, Councillor Johnson. We go back another 30 years beyond that. You're going back to the 1970s. So, Councillor Parry. Just one last question to Ms Leahy, if you don't mind, Mr Deputy Mayor. Um, if councillors look at page 923 in their booklet, how's debt payment been this year in context to previous years, Ms Leahy? So, page 923, 7... Debtors, if you don't mind, Ms. Lady. Has it been similar, same, or a bit less than previous years? It has been similar, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. I think, yes, Councillor Kettler. No, I wanted to ask a question on the sunset clause, that's all. Well, we'll wait till we get to the sunset clause. Um, I thank those uh, people for attending. We're now going to move to a confidential item. We've got one deputation. So that will be behind closed doors. Megan, if I can ask you to turn the live streaming off. Joan, seconded Councillor Johnson. Anyone against? Being no one against, uh, we're now resuming um, the agenda and item 6.2. Um, you'll notice that uh, there's been several items. Well, what I'll intend to do now bearing the uh, lateness of the hour. I'm going to work through the A3 sheet from top to bottom and ask uh, any other items to be withdrawn for next week other than the ones we discussed or any questions you may have on those items. So starting at the top of the page, item 13.3 and I believe Councillor Johnson you're putting an alternative recommendation on that one? Yeah that's right. Thank you. 13.2, Petition of Slip Lane, Shopping Centre, Kiara. That's me. I'll uh, just, you going to yeah, uh, an amendment? amendment yep. Thank you. You don't have to leave the room, Councillor McNamara. 13.8, uh, uh, Peachy House Road. 
Thank you. So if you think of making a, an alteration, amendment, uh, refusal, if you just try and let us know and get it in quick so everyone can have time to study. 13.9, uh, proposed wine, winery and incidental cellar door on Scrivener Road, Hearn Hill. And what's your intention, Councillor Scanlon? Thank you. Thank you. We well, can get them in early um, and perhaps talk together. You may be thinking, thinking the same things. I don't know. Item 3.1, North Allenbrook District Structure Plan. Item 3.2, request approved for public advertising, Guildford Heritage Area. 3.3, .3, draft heritage assessment of properties nominated in 2020. 3.4, adoption of the Altain Local Area Plan. 3.5, community colour review, review and use of distribution. 4.1 and 4.2, the uh, poultry farm on Cheltenham Street, Bennett Springs. Item 4.3, proposed amendment uh, to insert a development contribution plan in Henley Brook Urban Precinct. Item 4.4, the RAR on the proposed industrial premises, Bushmead Road, Hazelmere. Item 4.5 uh, is the extension to um, a house on James Street in Guildford. Item 4.6, proposed amendment to the uh, garden centre at uh, Stirling Street, Guildford. 4.7, SAT reconsideration, proposed civil work, site remediation, Clayton Street, Bellevue. 4.8, Council Recommendation, State Development Assessment Unit on the Gaston Road Stock Feed. Uh, the, which one, sorry? the 4.8. 4.8. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Do you know what you're going to do yet? or 4.9, Statutory Planning Decisions under Delegated Authority. 4.10, New Junction Sunset Clause. Councillor Catalano, you had a question? Vandalin, sorry. Um, I just am a bit confused with um, the report, um, only because actually now that I look at it, I'm confused with the business plan. So section 5.2 funding strategy, um, it's exactly the same sentence as the 7.3 wider financial implications to council, but they're actually um, got different figures. And I just, I can't for the life of me understand why there's two different figures there? Because one figure is 68.8 million within the next 10 years, and the next one says 42 million within the next 10 years. And I know it's from the business plan because I looked at the business plan, but now I'm just going, why is that different? So I don't get it. Mr. Deputy Mayor, just. Um, Do you want to take it on notice? On what, on what page are you, sir? It's, um, it, well, this hasn't got a page on it, but we're talking about um, Section 5.2 funding strategy, which yes. is... Within uh, the yeah, within the report. It doesn't actually, sorry, have a page number on it, so I can't direct you to that. And then over the page it says... It's the, it's the paragraph before desirability. <coughs> and then Section 7.3, wider financial implications to council... And it's lifted straight from the budget, but then I'm just thinking, why does it have two different figures when they're exactly the same sentence? I just um, can't figure it out. Mr Deputy Mayor, I'll take that on notice and get back to Councillor Cutler tomorrow. If you could let all councillors know, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, item 5.1, constriction of footpath. I think that's for a referral, Councillor Scanlon. Item 6.1, list of accounts paid. 6.2, change in base evaluation. 6.3, financial management report, the end of April. 6.4, sundry debt write-off. 6.5, budget adjustments. 6.6, 6, uh, Office of the Auditor General, annual information systems audit, the end of uh, June 2020. Six questions about that one. Yes. Uh, is it confidential? Uh, no. It's not. 
One of the attachments that are. Uh, the attachments are, yeah, the, it would inevitably get into the attachments. So maybe we can do that if we go behind closed doors later, or when we go behind closed doors. Uh, if we go behind closed doors later, we can, if there's time permitting. Otherwise, perhaps uh, follow it up with Miss Lay tomorrow. The challenge is that I do need to ask the questions so that councillors can hear them. No, that's need... fine. If we get time tonight, we'll deal with it. 6.7 policy debt collection rates and service charges. I think there's an alternative by Councillor Podovnik. 7.1 annual review of City's Register of Delegations. Uh, Councillor Parry, you're doing something there? Yes, an amendment, Mr Mayor. Thank you. 7.2 policy review election sign policy. C1.1, Councillor Catalano with your street trees. Uh, all the rest are. Um, Proposed motion, so I'll then go to item C 3.1, and Councillor Predovnik's got a, a motion on that, which is the last item we discussed behind closed doors. Councillor Kylie, may I'm interested if uh, if it would save time at all, if uh, one of my motions in um, item in uh, part C would be could be deferred, whether that would affect any timing to do with the um, workshops avenue at all, Mr. Coton. Whether that could be put off a month, whether that would save any time, Mr. Coton. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I don't see an issue with it being put off for a month. There, count, there is already a council resolution on the books which staff are working at. It's yeah. I guess ultimately, it's your motion, council. Ultimately, up to you. Thank you. Um, okay, that. Um, takes us to a question by Councillor Johnson in the confidential folder, so I'll need a motion to go back behind closed doors. Move Councillor Parry, second Councillor Congerton. Doors moves Councillor Parry, second Councillor Jones. Anyone against? We're now at behind closed doors. So I'd thank everyone for your participation tonight. Uh, for the questions, I thought it was a really good session and declared